Recording in progress. Okay, good evening, everyone. We're good to go? Yeah, okay, wonderful. I'd like to call this meeting to order um, to our regular meeting of PBAC um, on this Wednesday, April 5th. Thank you all for joining us this evening. It's so nice to be back in person. Nice to see all the committee members here and folks in the audience. Thank you for joining. Um, I'd like to ask the clerk to please take roll. Osselmeyer. Here. Bjorki. Bond. Here. Camarda. Tar. Here. Webb. Here. Hooper. Here. Earl. Barnacle. Okay, thank you. Um, before we dive into the... Excuse me. Oh. Wilkinson. Yes, I'm here. Um, okay, before we move on to approval of minutes, I just want to uh, just take note that the agenda does look different this evening. The city is moving towards some streamlining of agendas and the way they do minutes. Um, so thank you for kind of bearing with us as we navigate new agenda and also being back in person and all of the tech issues. So far, it's going really well and hope it stays that way. Um, but thank you all for your patience. Okay, we'll move on to approval of minutes. This is for our February 1st, 2023 meeting as we did not meet in March. I'd ask the committee at this time if there are any changes to the minutes. Okay, great. So we will approve the minutes without any changes as they're presented. We'll now move on to general public comment. During general public comment, the public is invited to make comments on items of public interest that are within the committee's subject matter jurisdiction and that are not listed on the current agenda. Public comments are limited up to three minutes per person, depending on the number of persons wishing to address the committee. Time will be allocated in equal shares, totaling no more than 15 minutes. I will now open general public comment and ask speakers to please bring their speaker cards to the clerk's desk if you have not done so already. Okay. Uh, clerk, have we received any comments prior to the meeting? There was one public comment received prior to the meeting, which was already posted. Thank you. Okay, um, would anyone from the public like to make a comment please come up at this time okay i'm not seeing anyone and so i will close general public comment and we will move on with our agenda okay first up we have a presentation from the petaluma equitable climate action coalition who will be sharing their recommendations to improve equity through transportation I will now invite presenter Ree Bussey, Program Coordinator of Daily Acts, to uh, deliver their presentation. Better? Oh, there we go. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So if we can go to the next slide. Perfect. So again, my name is Reed Bessie. She, her pronouns. I am the program coordinator for Petaluma Equitable Climate Action Coalition through Daily Acts. Um, 
we condensed our hour and a half presentation into 15 minutes, so I will try to go as fast as possible so we can get into the recommendation portion. So our agenda for tonight, welcome and introductions. We'll do a brief overview of what PCAC is and why it's needed, I'm sure most of you know, and our context and methodology, and then we'll get into the recommendations. Perfect. So. Again, our design team, Ree Bessie, she, her, program coordinator for Daily Acts. We also have Anna Lugo, who is our, uh, or excuse me, the founder of Equity First Consulting, who helped us with this project. And my name's Carrie Fugit, she, her, program manager at Daily Acts, and grateful to be supporting this project as well. And we have um, an amazing team. Not all of them could be here, so I would like to introduce the folks that are not here. We have Lynn Jin, Evan Cantwell, and Kylia Brown. And I will hand it over to Julio to introduce himself. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Julio, and my pronouns are he and his. Um, I work as a habitat restoration technician with Point Blue Conservation Science um, that works with students and teachers restoring like wetland. Or, the watershed, <laughs> and um, for the past six months, I've been part of the PCAC program, um, and yes, I'm happy to be here with all of you. Thank you. All right, so what is PCAC? It is a six-month equitable civic engagement program, and it's really des designed to support our participants in uplifting the voices of our communities that are most often left out of the conversations when it comes to climate change and um, climate change specifically due to transportation, which is what we focused on this time around. So why is it needed? Well, too often these communities, which are primarily uh, BIPOC communities that experience levels of toxic smog due to transportation, which in Petaluma, 60 to 7% of our greenhouse gases are due to transportation related emissions. So we wanna uplift these voices because transportation emissions have contributed to illnesses and cancer and asthma. Low-income people also spend a greater proportion of their income on transportation and BIPOC communities, low-income communities, unhoused experience, elevated traffic safety risks. So we want to ensure that these communities that are closest to the problem, which means they're typically closest to the solution, are bringing, being brought to the table. We want to create new structures of equitable civic engagement and really focus on these communities. And how do we do that is by the methodology that we use. So part one of, or step one of part one is making sure that we check our assumptions and biases because we all have them and we want to ensure that we're not perpetuating harmful narratives that can create a sense of distrust or shame within these communities that we actually want to be hearing from. So we do this by learning about equity principles, learning about transportation, systems thinking, designing to the margins. And designing to the margins basically means, so in the center is basically the people that we usually hear from. We want to design to these margins. We want to hear from our black communities, our LGBT communities, our impoverished communities. These are the folks that we want at the table talking about what they've experienced. And the systems design we use is the iceberg model, which is basically, this is what we're seeing, the tip of the iceberg. We want to get to the base of that iceberg. What systems are in place? What, what, what are those systems that have caused us to have this kind of behavioral thinking and how can we change that? Part two is conducting listening sessions. So we had a group listening, listening session that we were lucky enough to partner with uh, McDowell Family Resources and do a group listening session. And then also our participants were split into two teams and they conducted their own listening sessions. And then part three is applying these lessons that they learned from the methodology and synthesizing the input from these listening sessions to present these policy recommendations to city council, to our commissions, to our committees, and people actively involved with transportation in Petaluma. So our recommendations, we have our interactive map, which was the tangible recommendation. So these were site-specific. These were 
places that we went and put points like this needs a better sidewalk, this needs more trees, this needs more shade, this needs um, you know a class four bike lane. And then also our systemic recommendations, which most of our recommendations were focused on that because systems take a prioritization. So those were broken down into walking, biking, public transportation, and community engagement. So for that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Julio to start us off with the recommendations that they came up with. So that's the interactive map that um, we mentioned. Um, yeah, next slide, next slide. And so for, so for <laughs> I'm not used to the loudness. Um, so for um, first set of recommendations have to do with uh, walking and making Palermo more walkable. And so we recommend that the city prioritize a safe and enjoyable walking experience around key shopping centers and schools along McDowell and Washington. Um, specifically to make Petaluma more safe, um, we heard a lot of concerns about um, feeling unsafe in the nighttime and like walking and just like biking in the night. And so we need more lights. Um, for these extreme heat, these summers with extreme heat, we need more trees and um, our um, sidewalks and pedestrian overcross bridges need to be well kept so that people have that feeling of safety as well. Um, and as you see on the picture to the right, a lot of our um, main um, streets like McDowell and Washington have four lane roads. And um, these are direct um, ways to get to a lot of important places such as schools and shopping centers. Um, but it's very unpleasant to walk on these streets because of the feeling of like busyness of the cars. And so we recommend that um, we eliminate car lanes and we widen sidewalks because it feels pretty cramped and then that we have ADA compliant, um, like off on ramps and off ramps, yeah. Yeah, next slide. And um, so safe routes, um, this is a map that um, delineates the safe routes in Petaluma. Um, however, um, the definition of a safe route is very unclear and so, and so, yeah, it's very unclear what a safe route to school is. And four schools on this map actually don't have a safe route at all. And some routes don't see, seem safe at all, like I mentioned. Um, so yeah, so next slide. So what we recommend is that the city redefine criteria for safe routes to school to add more protective infrastructure and crossings. Specifically, we recommend that the city have crossing guards at the beginning um, and during the end um, of school days, and that uh, four lanes, four lane roads, um, not be included in safe routes to school because they fundamentally do not feel safe. Um, and we avoid major roads, and um, we demand that all schools have multiple safe routes to school. And so our next set of recommendations have to do with, sorry, with biking in Petaluma. Um, and so our first recommendation, we recommend the goal of transportation um, be bike safety, prioritization, and convenience. The most direct routes to important day-to-day -day locations all need protected bike lanes and traffic slowing. So there needs to be a barrier between a bike lane and um, a car so that people feel safe and have more of a desire to bike. And um, these, these streets need to be slowed down um, by, like, like I mentioned, eliminating car lanes and having more crosswalks. Um, yeah, next slide. And we have safe bike lanes. We have safe bike lanes, but we don't. People don't know where they are. I've been living here for a little over a year now, and um, I, I I didn't know there was like this really safe bike lane by my house until like six months or seven months after I had moved here. So we need maps and we need signage um, that makes it more clear where these bike lanes are and how to access them. Next slide. Yeah. And um, we also recommend that the city invest in creating a culture of respect and safety for bikers with priority on people who bike for necessity. Um, to do this, we recommend that the city add a process for reporting incidents between cars, bikes, and pedestrians to your report and issue site. Um, things, items that would be um, reported include near misses, issues with angry drivers, as well as injuries. Um, re having this process will help so that um, these issues are publicized and the city knows where, where they're happening so that they can be prevented. 
And we also recommend the city invest in a campaign to encourage more biking. Yeah. Next slide. Yeah. And so there, it's currently it's unpleasant and scary to cross from East Washington to West. Oh no, East Washington. I'm sorry. East Petaluma to West Petaluma. Um, if you're walking or biking. Um, so yeah. So but. Okay, next slide. But we see this as an opportunity because Petaluma is a lot, a lot of places to get, a lot of destinations in Petaluma are only one to three miles away. And so we recommend the city make it enjoyable, fast, and safe to cross between the east and west side of Petaluma via Washington Street so that um, it's easier to get to places by walking and biking. People are not walking or biking because it's not easy or safe um, to get to these to day to day locations. Um, and to do this, we recommend uh, specifically that Washington Street become two lanes, that there be um, a protected bike only lane, that the sidewalk be widened, and that the city encourage local food vendors to sell their to sell food so that it makes it more inviting to just like walk or bike or bike as well as um, planting plants, trees, and bushes, and have places to sit and relax. This will, be so, this will help revitalize East Washington Street and also revitalize Petaluma so that Petaluma is for people and not for cars. Well, I mean, yeah, for people and not for cars. Yeah, word. Hey. And um, go ahead, Ari. Okay, so public transit in Petaluma. Go to the next slide. So basically, this is um, active transportation, so we really wanted to focus on that with this meeting. But for busing and public transport in Petaluma, we really just recommend that the city invest in creating a dignified busing experience. And they can do this by lowering the barriers for new riders and also creating culturally responsive information access for students, immigrants, and also people that are low income. Next slide, please. But our biggest recommendation is we recommend just more integrated efforts between active transportation and public transit, specifically buses. And these are just questions that you can kind of think about, like how might your work improve safe access to public transport? And in what ways do you design with bus stops or transit hubs in mind? And then our final group of recommendations was for community engagement. So reach out. Um, we really wanted to shift from this culture of customer service where the community has to come here and come to you to a community ownership model and like really prioritizing community organizations that are already doing this work with underrepresented communities. And then when to engage these, both these recommendations kind of came from our McDowell listening session. So we had a student there who was, you know, evening times or weekends when people seem to be more available. Also, social media seems to be a great way to go. And then one of the mothers that was there at the McDowell listening session also mentioned, you know, going to schools at 8.30 a.m. when it's time to drop off the kids, like make it short, make it sweet, have some coffee, have some bagels, have some like donuts, make it kind of fun. And just talk to these parents. What are their needs? What are the needs? that they're seeing with their students that are in high school or that are in junior high or elementary school. And then finally, just creating accountability mechanisms, creating community engagement plans that really embed equity and just ensuring that lived experience is honored and valued and respected just as much as folks that have that like quantitative data quantitative data about themselves like they went and got a degree but people that are living this experience are the ones that are closest to this problem they have more of a say in what we should be doing they should have more of a say in what we're doing and how we're doing these things to ensure that they're actually equitable and then finally our closing call to action the biggest thing that we want to see is just collective accountability to really implement these recommendations and to continue to invest in programs like PCAC so we can see them continue citywide, countywide, statewide, all over the place. And that's basically it. I really appreciate you all for your time. Thank you, Julio, again. <laughs> Thank you.
Yeah, and we'll just open up for any questions or kudos to our amazing PCAC participant here. Okay, great, thank you all, all three of you for joining us this evening. Really appreciate that. Uh, I had the pleasure of hearing the full presentation, um, which was wonderful. I definitely encourage other committee members, if you um, haven't looked through the, the full uh, PowerPoint, which I believe the full one was shared, um, which has a lot more slides, definitely look through that. Um, and we can open it up for questions. And just as a reminder, we may not discuss, but just ask questions um, of the presenters. And if we want to agendize this and have a more formal uh, discussion, we can do that for a future meeting. So just let me know if that's something we want to do. Uh, but I'll open it up for questions. And please raise your physical hand this time instead of the icon. And I will try to uh, call on folks. And if that doesn't work, we'll just go on a line. But let's see if we can just do it. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for the presentation. Um, one of the things you talked about is communication and um, getting the word out to communities who need to use these other modes of transportation and get off, get out of their cars. So I'm wondering, what ideas do you have for the city and uh, perhaps things that we can consider here at this committee in terms of outreach? Uh, for example, we've, there's a program of wayfinding that the city's been working on for a long time that, that would assist people in knowing where they're at in the moment and how they want to get somewhere. They could use the wayfinding signs. Um, but thinking that you all may have some other ideas on how to communicate with user groups that would be affected by some of your ideas and policies, I thought I'd just ask what other ideas you have. If anyone wants to, yeah, go ahead. You can go to the podium. I have a clarifying question. Do you mean co communicating when it comes to like outreach for a specific project, or do you mean like communicating while people people all are like getting around, or yeah, what, yeah? Yeah, I think you know the idea of. I think you mentioned that you were not even familiar with some of the safer routes and bike routes and uh, better walking paths in your you know where you live. Um, just thinking that you might have some ideas on how to get that information out there to people who need it to get around safely. Um, yeah, I think maybe, like, like I mentioned, maps and strategic locations. And then, um, I, the like for Cornelia Road was the picture that I mentioned, or I had it on, on the screen. Um, it has painted signs, but maybe like even painting the street green, or even because um, those that that road specifically is very important because it goes it passes by two schools, um, Casa Grande, and then the other school is kind of like I forget what the school is, but it's like an elementary school. And so um, if there is like a, like the 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 whole road painted green, um, and other ways um, for it to be like the cars to be slowed down because I feel comfortable um, biking on it, but would a parent feel comfortable letting their child ride to school? And so I think that's like a very important question as well, and um, and making parents feel very comfortable with that as well, I think, would be very valuable. Mm -hmm. I'll add to that as well, because we had a great recommendation um, that got cut because of time for the bus that applies to this in terms of going to schools um, directly and um, working with teachers to get integrated into classrooms um, or events at the school um, so that students can learn about it. And then in that same theme, we think a lot about what are organizations, and Julio mentioned this, who are already in relationship with the communities and build relationship with those organizations, Petaluma People Services, McDowell Family Resource Center, COTS, um, and through those relationships, understand how to best um, share that information. One of our other Peacock participants also had like this great idea for um, having an app and um, just like they were mentioning a lot about how um, communications through different apps are just like inconsistent and it's really hard to like understand things, I guess. And so um, if Petaluma had an app that had these maps, um, whether like that, the same way that Google Maps has like the biking option and the busing option, I feel like that would be very helpful. Anyone else have a question? Go ahead. Well, 
I also want to say thank you very much for this presentation. I, I would also say that it'd be great if we could agendize this in a future meeting to have a more thorough discussion, but I will keep it to a question. Um, I just want to ask in terms of prioritizing, really prioritizing uh, the focus on biking for people who, who really need it as a necessity, which I thought was fantastic. Uh, I, I love the idea of an incident reporting app, and you just mentioned it a moment ago. In, in my experience, I've seen these things quickly fall apart because the way in which these apps are deployed is not really designed for the people who are using them. I just had a question in terms of what that looks like, what kind of information would you want to be collecting if we deployed a similar app in this case, really for incidents between bicyclists and cars? Are you referencing the report and issue mm -hmm. slide? Um, I think to what Julio is saying, the any incident that involves an interaction between biker, walker, and vehicle. So we really wanted to note that this is not just crashes, mm -hmm. um, but also angry drivers came up a lot in our listening yeah, sessions right. yeah. um, at, around that culture, which is why we really talked about the cultural mm -hmm. element of like, it doesn't feel safe from an infrastructure, but also from a cultural um, mm -hmm. sense to bike here um, due to kind of aggression on the road. Um, so I think really those, those elements in the report and issue would be awesome. I think the report and issue site is pretty general right now and offers a way for kind of large comment box. Um, so people can add what they want. Um, I just, uh, one of the, the, the recommendation really is kind of on the topics that people can report an issue on. There's nothing about bike incidences or pedestrian incidences. Gotcha. Thank you. And having that be more mobile friendly would be fantastic too. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have a, a question? Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. I also um, with Kelly and with Blake. Jerry didn't go. We, we were all at your previous session. So um, we had heard this before. And I wish that the only thing I wish is I wish you'd brought more of the, the kids. Um, that was so impressive to see high school kids and junior college kids speak to issues that we have been recognizing and deal, dealing with our entire times that we've been time that we've been on PBAC um, and even before that. So that would have been that would have been an added bonus. Like, for example, Julio, you had told a story about um, getting on your bike to go to work, mm -hmm. and you didn't know the Lynch Creek Trail was there, which I think was what you were, you, if you'd known that would have made it a much safer trip. That speaks to the fact that we need a map. And I just wanted to tell you, mention to you that we are doing a map. There will be an interactive map that comes out of our, um, our plan when we get it, when we get it finished. But, um, so that's, that's a positive. Um, as far as Pam asked, and then Blake, I think, followed that up, and I'm going to go along with that, also push on that same regard, I would love to know what organizations we could contact with. We know schools. We've already gotten that one under our hats. But we're looking for, you had mentioned PPSC. You had talked about the McDowell, McDowell Family Research. What other groups meet um, uh, so that we could go, perhaps, and have a listening session with them, or we could go and share information with them regarding something that we think that particular community needs to have. Are there other groups that you could recommend? Um, I'm not off the top of my head right now, um, but we, um, I think if you start with them and ask that question, you'll consistently get more recommendations. Um, so I think just starting, starting with a relationship and investing in their relationship is uh, what we really want to emphasize. Um, quality over quantity is kind of one of our programmatic mottos. Well, we, we tend to struggle um, when it comes to this kind of thing because we just we don't know which groups are already 
meeting or willing to sit down or would like us to come and make a presentation or have a listening session. I, yeah. Next time, if we get this on the agenda, that would be something that maybe we could pursue. I would just recommend, honestly, Petaluma People Services just to throw a name out there only because they're in the largest organization and right. they have a lot of fiscally sponsored programs and they're working with um, a lot of different subsets of the community. So in terms of a place to start, they're definitely not the only, but they have a lot of sub programs. So um, as a kind of reiterating kind of the emphasis on just picking one and starting to build a relationship um, and really emphasizing taking the time to be in relationship. Um, and so that would be kind of how I would respond to that on the floor. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kelly. Jerry, did, were you looking to say something? Uh, more of a comment than a question. Just don't let it uh, go into discussion and I'll allow it. <laughs> okay, okay. And that was a wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I feel a lot of the ideas that you presented are, are things that we have discussed here. So we're on the same same page, I think. There are other groups that have similar uh, goals uh, for this. Um, so speaking up uh, in different places, different people, I think, helps helps get that ball moving. I think it's, it's moving now. Um, and I guess maybe to make it a question, uh, participation in, in a group like this uh, would be good. So we would look for uh, people that when an opening may occur uh, to apply for this and, and get on PBAC and, and have your voice heard in this uh, format. Um, but this, this was great. I encourage you to continue. I like it. I love your idea about Washington. That's great. <laughs> all right. That's all. Um, I'll respond to your question. Um, uh, thank you for that. And I, I, that's one of, you know, that would be awesome um, to see. And one of the slides we cut for brevity was uh, around the methodology that I really want to lift up. Um, we're incredibly grateful. And I think Petaluma is setting a fantastic role model in investing in this program. And by investing, we were able to give an $1,800 stipend to every single participant to honor their time. And that's one of the system changes that we really want to integrate into the engagement mm -hmm. recommendations is how are we offering stipends um, to remove barriers to be able to participate in things like a commission. So yes, we would totally love to see that. And how are we funding folks who um, might have a financial barrier to participating otherwise? And we really appreciate the city helping make the case for why that's really important. And, and, and Peacock was designed to show that um, when we you know, remove barriers, we do get participation. There's a lot of interest to engage. So thank you. And, and Chair, I would also agree to uh, a future uh, agenda item. Great, thank you. And I just have uh, one question. Um, and I, I might just have missed something, but I believe you engaged parents, uh, lots of other folks through the, the listening sessions. Were there incentives like a gift card or something for their time in addition to the younger people that went through the program? Yes. So for our, um, besides our participants getting their $1,800 stipend for the participants of the three different listening sessions, the city actually funded a bike raffle. So there was two families picked. They each get um, four bikes. So they were able to fit like, you know, four adults. Do you have three adults and a children? So we do have two winners of that. And we were really excited to be able to offer that up this year. Um, and a lot of people are really excited. I actually heard from one of the listening session participants who was able to just pick up the bike on her son's birthday. So she was very excited to be able to offer that to him. So we did get to offer that to our, our participants for the sessions. Great. Thank you so much. Well, we appreciate your time. I think um, that's that's all of our questions. Okay, great. And we will look to agendize this for a future uh, meeting. Thank you all for being here. Really appreciate your time. Thanks Thank for you. having us.
All right. We will move on to our second presentation, which is from the Pedestrian and Bicycle Advisory Committee's Bicycle Parking Ad Hoc Committee. And Pamela Alsemeyer will guide us through the presentation. This was supposed to be uh, Kevin Bjorke. However, he was not able to join us today, so we will be very kind to Pamela. Um, she's going to go through the slides, but she may not be able to answer all the questions. And if we do have questions... The next item on our agenda that Bjorn has, we can probably ask him questions Pamela can't answer. So I'll just add that and go ahead. Sorry, Chair. Uh, just some quick housekeeping before we start this. Um, I got some feedback from someone who's watching um, our live cast that they're picking up a lot of typing. Um, so just a reminder to the committee, make sure that your mics are muted when you're not um, speaking. Shelly, are you? Yes, it, that's Shelly, are you muted? Okay, great. So, all right, I think we're probably fine. So thank you all. Good. So um, thanks, everybody. And, and of course, I want to give a big nod to Kevin because he did a lot of work. Uh, it's got to be hours and hours of making a survey of most of the areas within Petaluma to... Um, literally look at uh, what's present and, uh, and make some, uh, uh, collect some data as to the condition of what is present. And um, he's, he's gathered a lot of data points with, uh, backed up with photographs. So this presentation is a lot deeper than what we're gonna do right now, um, but I'm, I'm happy to, to walk through it with folks. So, so Bjorn, you'll just uh, click us through. So as you can see with, with the map that's being shown, um, a lot of uh, information was gathered. And he's got a lot of symbols here that would indicate uh, types of racks, um, locations, parking, uh, issues with racks that were uh, in place, uh, including um, how he saw the public using things that were not exactly bike racks and um, you know, which would suggest that there's a, a need for some additional racks or perhaps some communication as to how, how people can use what is really there. Um, and this slide actually shows the map length, so when people have an opportunity, you can pull that up and, and dig down into the data that he's, he's collected that backs this up. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, what he's, what he's uh, done here is um, look, looking at uh, uh, places where racks and um, uh, what I want to say here. So he's looking at public spaces here where we've got opportunities for bike racks and places where people should be finding easier spots to park their bikes. Um, I know that he made a survey of some of the places of employment. He highlights uh, the Target Shopping Center, which I know many of us in the community have had some concerns about how hard it is to find locations for um, employees to park. And, and I think part of what he's, he's highlighting here is, um, and it harkens back to the communication issue, is there's, um, there is some parking available for folks that arrive on bikes, employees, and the public, but it's not always obvious. And you know, making, um, making that a little bit more convenient and more obvious and more safe, um, we feel would uh, encourage more folks to use the bike racks that are out there. Um, so downtown transit. So. Um, here, are the, some of the comments here are, um, we've got a lot of uh, older style of parking. And, um, and really, I think one of the highlights that, that um, we want to make is, where are people um, gathering? Where are people going? And, and how to support people moving through town, <coughs> going to restaurants or places uh, that they gather, coffee shops, et cetera. And what can we do to make uh, that more convenient um, and he's highlighting the, 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 the post and, and loop idea that is throughout town with the, the great little egg on top that a lot of folks don't even know that that's a bike rack. Um, and, uh, so, you know, there's, there's that issue. Um, 
And, and I think that what we wanted to, uh, at some point in time, get more input from folks is where should we be having additional racks downtown? I know Bjorn will have some thoughts on this. And of course, there will be some uh, constraints downtown due to some of the historic uh, overlay requirements. But I think that there's some great opportunities there. Um, and then on to the next slide. Uh, so I think that he's highlighting here that uh, there are bike racks that are in sight, but not often used. Um, maybe there are some lessons learned uh, here as to why people aren't using racks or if they um, didn't notice them or don't find them to be uh, the kind of racks that you can attach your bikes to comfortably and easily with the kind of locks you have. And of course, he's, they, we're also pointing out the fact that there's um, a bunch of racks here locked up and not accessible. And uh, the idea that we may be um, contacting some of these shopping center owners or store owners to ask what they might be able to do, recognizing that, that they're not obligated, but maybe they'll be doing some things um, if we request so they can get some more folks to, to come to their shopping areas. Um, uh, here's the, here the question is, what type of bike rack arrangements do we have at um, the transit stops? And um, is there something we should be doing to make this more accessible or, or used by more people? Um, something to make it more friendly. I know there's been conversations around uh, what can we do to provide covered bike racks? Um, realizing in some situations that's going to take up too much landscape, too much real property. Uh, but we've had such a rainy season um, and, you know, between uh, rainfall and heat, perhaps we can give some thought to what else we can do at some of the locations to, to make it more accessible and, and amenable to all day pipe parking. Um, okay. Here's a, a couple of, of, um, of, of photos showing how inaccessible and inhospitable some of the bike racks can be as just kind of these would be the bad boys, I suppose, to, 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 uh, to call out these spots. Um, and, uh, you know, it's been a while since um, I've been on the committee where we actually looked at plans for locations of bike racks. And I think that these can all be lessons learned to us about um, suggested areas and then making sure that they are actually implemented in places where employees and the public can get to them and, and not necessarily in a drive aisle, something like that. Okay, next slide. Right, okay, so here the idea uh, is that, um, you know, people are bringing their bikes into Putnam Plaza, et cetera, along the boulevard, and if they can't find a place to uh, to lock up their bike, well, they're gonna they're gonna do it on um, along a tree in a in a tree well, uh, and perhaps there are better arrangements. So, um, so again, the emphasis being let's let's make sure that the places where people are going on their bikes, we can make those the most um, convenient and enticing for folks to feel like they can leave their bikes comfortably and safely. Yeah, and then perhaps this one's uh, for Bjorn to come back to about the uh, program of requesting uh, bike racks and, uh, and what response he's gotten uh, to folks who are interested in this so that we can continue to um, provide racks where people are asking for them. Um, Okay, and so this is just maybe some high-level uh, overview of where we think uh, additional racks may be needed. Um, I think some of these might be intuitive, and we might be able to, to say, oh, yeah, I go down Kentucky Street, and there's only a couple of post and loop, and we don't, you know, it's people are parking to trees. So what could we do in that area? And I know, Bjorn, you've, you'll have some ideas on that. Um, but I, you know, you, I can, I think that you can see there's some, uh, there's, you know, some areas where there's some concentrated need, and boy, wouldn't it be nice to take some cars off the street in the downtown area and uh, encourage people to come down. Um, 
So with theaters, parks, uh, parking structures um, near some of the open space areas. And, uh, you know, we have some festivals and things downtown. Maybe there are ways uh, along Water Street, down by McNear Peninsula, uh, other ways to kind of uh, have enhanced parking so we can we can have more people come on down. I know we, we're planning on new development right down there, it would appear, by uh, the McNear Peninsula. Okay, last slide. Um, yeah, we've touched on this. Uh, where where are people going? Where can we provide additional racks? Maybe we'll all on our walks and throughout town notice what the ad hoc parking is, is meaning what are people really doing with their bikes? And maybe we can make it more obvious and convenient for them. And then, um, of course, there's a there's uh, some very uh, clever and, and artfully inspired racks that um, I think make Petaluma uh, a wonderful place. Maybe we can have uh, some employment, places of employment or these restaurants uh, offer something that's a little unique and keep us unique down here in Petaluma. Okay, that's what I got. Well, I think Thanks, you folks. did a pretty great job for... Uh jumping in there and not having thank prepared you, for the presentation. So thank, thank you, you, Pamela. I appreciate that. Great. Um, so I will open it up and let's just go down the line. So Jerry or Blake, do either of you want to start? Okay. Sorry. I saw your hand. Sorry. You'll have to wait, Blake. All right. Go ahead, Jerry. Okay. Uh, great presentation. Um, I think we did at one time talk about um, the parking on Kentucky uh, in regard of, of taking away a couple parking spots because uh, throughout downtown, there really is no one location to put bikes. You have to create one. And the logical thing would be to create it by removing parking spots, which would be a benefit in itself. Uh, so yeah, it's interesting, nothing out at Prince Park. Um, that would certainly be got little people right if they can ride their bikes out there that would be even better uh, yeah jerry could i just mention the idea of parking you know down on uh, kentucky and maybe on the boulevard um we thought that all with all the parklets and the restaurants that are mm -hmm. bringing tables and chairs you know onto the street or onto the sidewalk maybe there's the ability to grab some parking spaces on either exactly. side to, exactly. To, yeah, yeah, I mean, we yeah. know some. Well, that comes every yeah. Time. Yes, yeah. right, right. So they're protected well, maybe from cars backing up. traffic on Kentucky altogether. <laughs> um, but we won't go there right now. <laughs> um, so, yeah, a, a need for, for parking. And, and, of course, the more bikes we get going out there, the more parking we're going to need. So a yeah, very nice report. Thank you. Marsha, you have anything? We're in order. <laughs> okay. Um, I wanted to thank um, whoever, Kevin, who did this. This is Kevin. this is amazing. I have a sneaking hunch that Bjorn had something to do with it because I can remember four or five years ago he did a, a was t he had a map with him and was downtown marking where this was and where that was, et cetera. And so thank you, Bjorn, from uh, a long time ago. Um, I wanted to mention that the one thing that I have been starting to pay attention to or trying to, particularly knowing this was coming up as a presentation tonight, was as I walk, I'm the walker, remember, um, as I walk through town, I'm trying to figure out why people, where people are going. Now, a lot of people are just riding their bikes. I have a sneaking hunch they're starting at home and taking a ride, such as what Jerry probably does, and then takes his bike back home. But there are lots of other folks. I was at the library today, and there were a whole slew of kids who came in on bikes. And that surprised me. And there are, um, we have a number of biking, um, bike parking at the library, but we didn't have enough today. So um, I was thinking that's, you know, a given. Um, all of our parks, we have a lot of kids who are riding bicycles and or skateboards and going to parks. And oftentimes they have no place to leave that bike. Some of our parks have a bike rack or two, not necessarily in an area maybe that it needs to be. Um, I can think of Washington Street Park, which I don't know what the real name of the park is, but it's the one that's far out. 
it's almost just past the golf course, Rooster Run. And that particular location needs a whole bunch of park um, bike parking devices because um, a lot of kids are going that direction, as well as Prince Park. Prince Park didn't have any. I walked from Prince Park yesterday, and the, I couldn't find a bike rack. I may have missed something, but I was I was trying, and I was having a hard time. So I, I very much appreciate our taking a survey of town and really zeroing in on this, because if we want to get people out of their cars, we need to know where they're going and how they're, the mode of transportation they're choosing to take, and then providing them the amenity at the end that would, or in the middle, that would help them do what it is that they're, they're out doing, whether it's stopping at one of the markets or um, doing a bit of downtown shopping, um, coming to City Hall for a meeting, whatever. And we don't have enough bike racks here either. It's another place. So it's kind of opening my eyes, and I, I think all of us can benefit by just that, is taking a look and, and asking people, if you see people on bikes, where are you going? Where would you start from? What's your aim? Where are you going next? And that helps us make decisions about what's next. Anyway, thank you for the report. I have to push the button. Um, so, I, you know, our rec person isn't here tonight, right? And so I liked the idea with... I can't pronounce the, the the letters of the presentation. The P P P A C. Yeah. P P. Anyway, so you know they talked about quality as opposed to quantity, right? And I was like, and you know, so let's start with the one group. So my idea is really we need to just if we can get all our parks to have bike racks, then that's a big thing because then that that helps satisfy the children in our town, right? So yes, it's important to do downtown, but I think it's even more important to do the parks and work on that big time and make that be our quality work. And so that the kids get more familiar with that and then they convince mom and dad when they go downtown to take their bikes, right? So if we could work on parks first and get them going and work on that quality, of bike racks, then I think it will help, you know, because then it, it puts our future out there, the future of the children of, of Petaluma. So that's my sort of ask, and, and she's not here to ask, so, okay. Well, I'm sure this is just the beginning um, with this stuff. I have a couple questions, and then we can keep going to Blake. Okay, um, let's see. I don't know if you can answer this, Pamela, but um, I'm wondering if Feeder Square Garage has bike racks inside. And I haven't looked super closely at the map, but was that captured? Because I don't think there's any signage outside. And I drove into it one day and I was like, what? What? There, There's bike parking in here? Um, and I feel like with some more promotion, anyway, go ahead. I thought there was a little bit of parking right as you enter. Um, uh, as you're headed down towards the water. I think if you go in and you make a hard right, I think there's a little bit of parking there. But Blake's raising his eyebrows. Anyone else seen those? But I've well, seen it. It's because I, I live right over there, and there is bike parking, but it's meant to be for employees oh, who yes. live there. Oh, yes. All right, right. Okay. Yeah. I was just wondering if it was captured on the map uh, because I've seen it, and yeah. I feel like it's very hidden. I wasn't sure if it was captured. Well, right. But... And, you know, the other thing that's worth noting, and certainly if anyone's listening um, when Theater Square was being developed, you know, all of the railings along the walkway that surrounds that entire building was really designed in the hopes that people would use it for bike parking. Mm -hmm. I don't know who's been here long enough to kind of remember that, but oh. you know how there's that differential in height mm -hmm. between some of the on-street parking and the walkway, like on the back side of Theater Square. Mm -hmm. All all of that, um, you know, it's it's you know metal fencing, so to speak. It's like banister looking people can use that and it was thought that folks would actually park along that do you remember that marja oh, yeah but again that's i think that's a little too esoteric for folks you know okay well uh, thank you for uh, answering that and I'll, I'll take a deeper dive into the map and what's all in there um last thing i like the thinking about rain and heat seats can get really hot um i would also add this is very specific, but um, during the holiday season at Brewster's, they had kind of a fake Christmas snow, 
And where did all the snow go outside? Right onto my bike um, that was parked at the bike <laughs> rack and it was just covered in white foam. Um, so I feel like there, there are a number of things that we might want to, I mean, that's a very specific thing that I don't think would be replicated throughout the city, but um, definitely heat, rain, and I don't know if there are other considerations, but um, coverings for, for bike parking could be really helpful. And I'll leave it at that. And go ahead, Blake. Thank you. I also wanted to thank you as well for the report and thank Kevin by extension for the immense detail for all of this. I, I mostly had uh, comments. A lot of this is because some of the areas that you highlighted in the report, even some of the pictures that you presented were areas where when I used to have to regularly bike to bus to commute, those were places where I would actually avoid bike parking because of some of the issues in those zones. And one thing I like about this report is that it kind of brings up, without saying it, the issue that Petaluma has, which is we're kind of great if you enjoy biking, we're terrible if you need to bike. Mm -hmm. And so just talking about transit connections, the, in fact, the image that you have in the, the slide, that area, my friends and I and most of us who are regularly taking the 101 from the mail depot, we would never put our bikes there. And part of the thing is it's it has to do with what you need the parking for. So if you're going to commute, you're not going to see your bike for probably eight hours or more. So you want to know that it's safe. I regularly would park my bike, you know, the parking lot right by Mail Depot, the giant stop sign right in the back by the fence. I would just hide my bike back there with the grass because we all knew that if you put a bike on those racks for more than five hours, you were not going to have your bike. So at one point I would make, if we're talking about bike parking for transit corridors, I know it's more space, but some kind of covered or like park, locked parking is going to be critical because unless you're, if you're taking the bike with you on the bus, then you don't need the, the bike lock. And if you're leaving it there, you have to trust that it's going to stay there. Um, one thing I was going to say about downtown, and I know everybody has covered this pretty well, those, the, those historic loop locks, I mean, the other day, because I knew we were going to talk about this, I went down and walked around again and, and took some photos of my own. And one of them I could literally pull loose just by, I mean, I don't know who in their right mind would lock, like lock their bike there. Uh, one thing I was going to propose, I, I know some of this is for loading, but if we're concerned about uh, historic, hi historic conflict, um, there's the alleyways, the long bisecting alleyways we have. We could turn that into a massive bike parking area. It's out of the way of everything else. They're pretty active now because there's shops along them, but those, the narrow alleyways that intersect with the plaza area by Starbucks, those could be great spots for bike parking. So I was gonna say the plaza by Starbucks is tragically underused and is right in the middle of downtown. You could put a number of spots there. There's also the avenue right across from Starbucks, which I'm not trying to center it there. It's just those are two very open areas. And then also the parking lot right across from I know it's not Acre anymore, I know the name changed, but across from that coffee shop, uh, that whole area, we could easily take some spots from, I don't know who owns that, but if the city did, we could take some spots from there and that'd be another great spot, all kind of providing a nice triangle effect of spots for parking. Um, the other thing I was gonna bring up about stores and businesses, this goes back to the theft issue again. I think we really need to find a way to mandate, and, and this comes up at planning and is something I've tried to keep an eye on. If we're to have bike parking, it should be by the entrances. And part of that is so that people feel safe, that enough people are seeing their bikes at all times. You're unlike, you're, you're gonna feel a lot less worried that somebody's gonna come with a hacksaw and try to take off your lock in public if the bike locks are right by the entrance, as opposed to where they typically are in a lot of these spots, which is, you know, right around the back or off to the side. Uh, and then the, the only other thing I was going to say is that that map very clearly shows deserts. I agree completely with the, the, park, the parks comment about making sure we've really invested in spots there. But the other thing I was going to say is that we have like a number of, like they're not really grocery stores, but marts throughout the city that people kind of forget about those are also areas where people go to get random groceries in the middle of the night or what have you. And those are also good spots for, for some bike parking. That's all. Thank you. Like the 7-Elevens? Mm -hmm. 
All right. Um, well, with that, we can close out this presentation item and keep on the theme of bike racks. And we can move on to uh, item three. We're going to receive a presentation and provide feedback on the bike rack design and placement, uh, which is exempt from CEQA. Um, and I will turn it over to Bjorn. All right. Thank you, Chair. And formally, I can say good evening, committee members. Um, Sorry, my mic came unplugged here. Um, so yeah, you all touched on a lot of um, items that I will cover in this presentation. Um, this is coming to you because the city has a bike, uh, a grant uh, for about $33,000 to install bike racks. And um, before placing that order and, um, and, and getting the ball rolling there, um, we would really like to um, receive feedback from PBAC and from the Historic and Cultural Preservation Committee, um, which we're doing next week, on updated um, an updated bike rack design uh, that we can use citywide, including in the, um, the historic commercial district downtown. So um, that's the reason for uh, tonight's presentation, but it's also just a really good opportunity to um, check in on bike parking generally and sort of update you on um, uh, what we're thinking about and, uh, and get your feedback. Um, so as was discussed in the previous presentation, um, that, that historic uh, post and ring rack was standardized in the early 2000s um, and deemed compatible with the, um, with the historic district's uh, guidelines and aesthetics. Um, we don't have really a citywide standard as far as bike racks go, and I'll touch on this a little bit later, but um, when you read our, um, our zoning code or any other um, uh, guidance, um, there, we're not very specific. And so there's a, lot, there are, there's a lot we can do to update our codes and standards to uh, better reflect best practices and address things like what the rack, the, the rack types um, and also the placement relative to um, entrances, you know, requiring them within a certain distance of a front entrance, for example. Um, there's just a lot we can do to um, modernize our um, codes and standards on, on bike parking. So what we'd like to do tonight um, is uh, we'd love to, to get your input on a new rack that meets best practices um, to be used on our public streets, trails, parks, um, all city facilities. And then also um, get your initial thoughts and feedback on where to prioritize uh, sidewalk installations versus on-street bike corrals. Um, and there is some there is some consideration there. There are some trade-offs with each. So, I'll touch on that a little bit. Issues with the current racks downtown. Um, the ring is easy to cut. You can see in this picture. And as um, committee member Hooper described, uh, we've seen a lot of issues with the rings falling out. And um, other feedback we've received, or what we know based on best practices, they don't easily accommodate as many um, frame sizes and types because there isn't as much contact between the rack and the bike. Um, and then also we've heard that they're kind of hard to find. They don't really stick out and um, they're not necessarily intuitive. Some people don't even know that they're bike racks. They think they're like decorative um, uh, hitching posts. <laughs> so, um, these are some of the options that we have identified. Uh, we've reached out to several bike parking vendors, you know, reviewed best industry best practices. And um, uh, there's a, a, a local vendor that actually um, makes their racks in the USA. They're local to the Bay Area. So their shipping costs are actually very low um, compared to most uh, of the manufacturers. And um, they, have the be they have the most competitive pricing. So um, we've identified a few racks that they offer that, um, that meet best practices. These are, they're actually used um, throughout the Bay Area, including in San Francisco and Oakland. They've sort of standardized um, these racks. They hold bikes upright. They accommodate uh, a greater variety of uh, frame sizes and types than our current racks. They enable the wheel and frame to be locked with a single U-lock, which is really important. And uh, most importantly, they're durable and they're extremely hard to cut or vandalize. So these all use um, two by two inch square tubing. 
and they are um, galvanized steel. And galvanized steel is by far the most um, resistant to uh, corroding, and um, and it's it's a very durable material. So these are the dimensions of those three um, racks, um, similar sizes. You know, the circular is definitely the widest of the three. Um, at its at its widest, it's about thirty six inches wide, thirty two inches tall. Um, the flat top rack, thirty four inches tall, twenty four inches wide, and then the the standard um, the what they call the the series rack is um, the narrowest. And I don't expect P back to be as um, uh, for you to care as much about the dimensions, but including this because again I'm going to the <laughs> Historic and Cultural Preservation Committee next week, where they may very well care about dimensions. Um, and then, so then to the discussion about uh, placement. So, you know, we have two options. We can install them on sidewalks or in on-street bike corrals and the trade-offs associated with each. So sidewalk racks are ultimately the most convenient because um, they can be installed right outside, uh, you know, every, basically every place of business or destination where someone would want to, um, to visit. Um, that being said, they do present some accessibility and uh, challenges if they're installed incorrectly or installed on narrow sidewalks. Um, they can also come into conflict with you know, other sidewalk activity because, um, and especially in our downtown, right? We have a lot of, there's a lot of activity, you know, pedestrian activity, you've got sidewalk sales going on, you've got outdoor dining. so. Um, there are some, some, there are some challenges there, and you have to be really thoughtful about how you, um, how and where you install them. Uh, you know, we know that if they're, if those bike racks on, on the sidewalk are hidden behind a parked car, then you're not necessarily going to see them and know that they're there. So that's one advantage for on-street bike corrals too. Is you know, you, you're riding down a street and they really stand out. It's you, you would, it'd be very hard to miss an on-street bike corral. Um, and then for maintenance, the edge goes to sidewalk racks because on-street bike corrals do require hand sweeping periodically. Um, you obviously can't get a street sweeper in there. So um, the good news, I, I believe there is um, quite a bit of hand sweeping already happening downtown, um, but, um, but it's definitely a consideration. So these, this is uh, from the Association of Pedestrian and Bicycle Professionals. They have a, a great document called Essentials of Bike Parking. And I think they've actually updated it a couple of times, um, but there's a link here in the, in the presentation. You can go check it out. Um, and they, not only do they provide guidance on rack design, but also on um, placement. And so this is their guidance on how to um, site Side, or where, where to install sidewalk racks uh, relative to buildings, parked cars, et cetera. Um, and I would, I would guess that most of our sidewalks downtown do not meet the, the desired um, width that they have uh, here. 96, 96 inches, it's what, eight feet? So having eight, eight feet between a bike rack and a building, I don't think we really have that anywhere. Um, at least in the, the historic downtown. So if we were to look at um, on-street bike corrals, we, we could actually um, install several downtown without having any impacts on um, vehicular parking or, um, or on you know, the potential for parklets in the future. Um, we've already red curbed near a lot of our intersections and crosswalks for um, you know, to accommodate turning movements for uh, emergency vehicles and also for um, just for sight lines for, uh, you know, for safety reasons. So, um, you know, these are some, some examples um, from left to right there. You've got, uh, that's 4th Street at B right in front of the museum. Um, and then these other two pictures are uh, the entryways to the block of Kentucky between um, Western and Washington where we've got red curbs on both sides. Um, and and uh, I don't have the exact figure, but I, I don't believe we allow parklets within um, 15 to 20 feet of intersections. So again, if you're, if you're locating these at the corners, um, sort of a win-win because you're, you're, you're putting them where really nothing else can, can go there. Um, so those are, yeah, 
just throwing that out there that there's definitely some, some potential. Um, here's the information about the study session for the Historic and Cultural Preservation Committee. Um, they'll also be reviewing um, updated trash receptacles for the historic district. So that's next Tuesday at 4 p.m. Um, meeting details to be posted on our meeting page. And then some other bike parking efforts. Uh, we've got the bike parking request form up on the city website. We'll be reviewing that before we um, you know, finalize uh, installation locations and, and, make, and try to uh, basic, use that as, as some of our, to, to factor into our, um, our locations. And then we are also working closely with the, um, with the uh, community development department to uh, update our standards and, um, and suggest some, even some code amendments to infu- ensure that bike parking installations on private property as part of development projects meet best practices. Um, there's, like I said, there's, we need to do a lot of updating there. Um, so that's all for the presentation. I think, again, the two, the two key things that I'm really hoping for from feedback, feedback on um, if you have a preference between any of these three racks that we're showing, and then also um, some, maybe some general criteria or guidance on where to prioritize um, on-street bike corrals versus, um, versus sidewalk installations. And with that, I'll hand it back to you. Great. Thank you, Bjorn. Uh, Appreciate that presentation. So we will now move to any questions from the committee. So please keep it to questions. We will then go to public comment. Then we will come back and you can make other comments that you would uh, like. But let's keep it to questions until we hear public comment. Um, So I'll start with Blake this time if you have uh, any questions for Bjorn. Um, From from the, I guess from a, public workers or from the city's perspective, looking at the three designs, is there a, um, I guess, a more efficient choice when it comes to making sure that like a corral, for example, would get like the maximum number of parking spots or is it more or less the same number of potential racks across the board? Yeah, they would all be roughly the same footprint, at least, um, you know, uh, as far as the Yes, same footprint, pretty much. While the width varies, that wouldn't impact the the bike corral footprint. Got it. Yeah. And then with regards to best placement of corral versus on sidewalk, does corral become much more problematic in locations where the parking's more restricted or where perhaps there's only like a narrow bike lane across from the sidewalk? Um, you know, with corrals, it's, um, so if we're talking about, uh, you know, downtown, there's just, there's going to be more scrutiny placed on, uh, avoiding vehicular parking removal, right. And trying Mm -hmm. to capitalize on or take advantage of those existing red curbs, Mm -hmm. um, outside of downtown, I think we would be hesitant to install on street corrals unless we had, um, maybe a business owner uh, who requests it and, and who agrees to maintain them. That's mm-hmm. what most other cities do is they would, um, they actually, you know, Oakland and I believe San Francisco, they only do them by request. Um, okay. if, a, if a business owner says, I want this in front of my business and I will maintain it, I'll sweep it, you know, every week, keep it clear of debris. Um, because of the sort of the special, con- the unique conditions downtown, Um, that's probably the only place where we would consider Mm -hmm. installing corrals without having that business, um, Mm -hmm. ownership or sponsorship. Um, well, but it would still definitely be nice to have, um, but downtown just because of the congestion and all the sidewalk activity, you know, I think there's a recognition from us at staff that it may be difficult to accommodate the, the amount and quality of bike parking we want downtown Mm -hmm. on sidewalks. Oh, fair enough. And then just one more question with uh, businesses requesting crowds in those other cities, do they have incentive programs to try and get businesses to want to invest more in that kind of bicycle park? Because I imagine that would dramatically increase the amount of bicycle parking at a given business. I think the the primary incentive is, you know, the city 
um, picking up the the cost and installation of the corral and and then um, you know as long as the business owner is willing to keep it mm. clean um, and there may be a small fee that some cities charged I haven't looked at that for a while but um, uh, you know generally speaking as a, if our goal as a city is to provide bike parking within the public right of way, right? Within our city yeah. owned right of way. So we can, while we can make these installations on sidewalks and, and mm-hmm. um, on streets and in parks and here at city hall, um, we, we can't go into, you know, a parking, a privately owned parking lot outside a shopping center and, and make these yeah. same installations. So that's where it's really, you know, hopefully there's some education, right? Um, and, uh, and, you know, uh, anyone in the community can can go to a, a business and say, "Hey, I'm a, I, I frequent your business, and your bike parking is really lousy." Um, and feel free to use <laughs> some of the resources we're developing, you know, around how to look, where to install them, and um, and what types of racks to use as a resource. Um, uh, just unfortunately, we're sort of limited there. If, if a project's yeah. already been approved, yeah, there's not much we can do. Fair enough. Thank you. Great. I don't have any questions right now, so I'll pass it along. Bjorn, how much did you say uh, the grant was? Eighteen thousand, and yeah, it's uh, it's a little over thirty-three thousand. Thirty-three thousand, yeah. and about how many racks uh, do you think we can extract out of that with costs of installation, et cetera? It's, uh, it's the material the cost of all materials have gone way up, especially, um, steel and, and bike racks. I don't have current pricing, uh, would really hope that we could install at least 50 with this first round, you know, ideally closer to a hundred. Mm-hmm. Um, but we'll have to see how the pricing works out. Yeah. Yeah. And is it your recommendation that we focus in a particular area with this first round to try to address some of the, perhaps the downtown issues or other areas where there's a, a lack? Uh, are you recommending we focus in certain areas? The majority of the feedback we've received has been specific to downtown. Um, and you know this that's another point of feedback we'd be happy to take from PBAC to um, locations to consider as we're developing that list. Um, we haven't really we haven't really gone through that exercise yet because we haven't, when, once we pick a rack, we're going to then get the pricing and then we'll know how many racks we can install. And then we'll kind of, okay. so Go from there. we're taking it one step at a time, but ha- definitely open to feedback from PBAC on um, locations mm-hmm. to consider. Mm-hmm. We're, downtown will definitely be one, um, mm-hmm. but, but open to other locations, including mm-hmm. parks. Yeah. And did you give some consideration to kind of treating this to like a pilot that we might uh, put racks in, uh, see what the usage is, and if there's a, a, a better use, a uh, higher use somewhere else? I mean, if we find people aren't using them, we can take them up out of the street. They're just bolted in, right? So is that kind of the idea, or do we think of this as, as rather permanent? Yeah, I, I would... I mean, while we do have that flexibility to, these are not going to be in, embedded in the concrete per best practices. Um, mm-hmm. We uh, definitely our preference to make installations that we know will have utility now and in the future. And, and then um, basically as we get funding, as we identify funding for future installations, we're going on to the next several locations um, and adding bike racks. Um, you know, we know that we there's a, a need for bike park, more bike parking citywide. So mm-hmm. this is just our first. This is the first grant, right? In this, um, mm-hmm. uh, and but there will be many, many more bike parking projects to come. <laughs> Lots of future installations to come. Yeah, that's that's all I've got right now. Yeah. I don't have any questions at the moment. That's fine. We'll move on to Marsha if you have any questions. Um, thanks for all the information, Bjorn, that you're providing us. Um, I'm very concerned about putting anything more on the sidewalks downtown. Um, our sidewalks are very narrow downtown. We have tree plantings all every 20 feet, which gives them that 
dip that's right, you know, that square of soil that is there where you can fall in or your stroller wheel gets caught or your bicycle wheel gets caught. God forbid you'd be riding a bicycle on a downtown street, but I have more than seen it happen once, if not a dozen times. But we just have too much going on. We've got tent signs. Um, we've got sidewalks that are in very bad repair. And so to put one more object on, particularly on the boulevard, well, Kentucky isn't much better, it's, it's really dicey. And I very much ap appreciate the conversation talking about bike carousels in the roadway, in, as, as you have um, so succinctly mentioned, Bjorn, maybe, maybe putting them at Putnam Park, somewhere near behind Putnam Park or at the back of Putnam Park. Um, or the street that's directly across the, I don't know what that street's called. It leads to Washington Street, goes from um, Starbucks to Washington Street. That area might be another area where we could put some kind of um, bike racks. Another possibility would be the alleyway that's next to Central Market. That's um, got lots of width in there. That might be a location. The A Street parking lot might be a location. And I love the idea of putting them in the reddened, zone, reddened zones downtown at the ends of blocks or next to adjacent to um, some of our pop-ups. It's just, there are all kinds of ways we could do this, but I am hopeful that we don't put them on the sidewalk. Um, Sorry, Marcia, did you have a question for Bjorn? Oh, sorry. We're going to get to comments no. after we hear from the public. We're just not supposed to give comments before we hear from people. You're sorry. Right. Thank you very much for that reminder. Sorry. Okay, Jerry, do you have any questions? I have no questions. Okay. So we will move to public comment and then come back to this committee and we can resume our discussion. Um, pu the public is invited to make comments on this item. Public comments are limited to three minutes per person. If you haven't done so already, uh, Pete, <laughs> please fill out a speaker card and bring it to the clerk. Uh, clerk, were there any comments received prior to the meeting? There were no public comments received. Okay, thank you. And do we have any public comments? We do not. Okay, great. Okay, so we will bring it back to uh, this committee for discussion. Marja, I'm happy to send it back to you, and you can continue. Go ahead. Thank you, Kelly. I apologize to all. Um, I guess it's, I'm so excited about being back where we can see each other in person and we don't have to hide behind the Zoom wall. Um, so no, I would prefer not to have bike racks on sidewalks. Um, I would prefer to have them in bike-like corrals. I think that makes a great deal of sense. And I think if we look carefully at the at just specifically to the downtown, other areas that would not, my comments would not hold true. Um, so that was what I wanted to say regarding bike rack placement. And then as far as the bike, the choices that we have, um, I don't use bike racks very often, so I honestly don't know anything about these choices. My assumption that would be the location of the bike rack would denote maybe what fits better in that space. I, I don't know that. Do all of the, but my question is to Bjorn, do all of the bike, the three different versions that we've seen. Do all of them accommodate the electric bike or the um, the bike with trailers or the commuter bike? That's not yeah. a problem. Yeah, these, these are, um, they'll all accommodate um, heavy bikes, uh, longer bikes. Yeah, what you name it. These are probably, you know, sort of a universal design for bike racks. So, okay, thank yeah. you. And that's all I had for questions. Or comments. So you did have a question in there, Marcia. Oh, good. <laughs> um, Jerry, I'll, I'll go to you, and then we can keep going back this way. Okay, great. Um, so, yeah, I, I would agree with the, a lot of what Marcia said, that the downtown sidewalks, uh, they they're, can't accommodate uh, any bicycles. Um, and the corrals, I think, are a much better idea. They, you also have the advantage of safety in, in numbers. Uh, to to Blake's point of, of where you park your bike and, and being very visible, if you have six or eight or ten bikes all in one spot, one of those bike owners is likely going in or out, uh, which I, I know as a bike rider, I would keep an eye on someone's bike. Uh, if I saw someone with a hacksaw, I'd be suspicious. Um, 
And, and uh, one of the other comments that came up to was uh, the garages. And you were talking about uh, putting a bike uh, sheltering out, out of uh, uh, fake snow or rain or heat. And uh, I think the garages would, would uh, solve two of those issues. Uh, you know, keep it protected and, and also a corral kind of out of the way. And uh, I think that would be a good placement. Uh, and I also like the street across from uh, Starbucks, that little short alley that goes down to um, Water Street. I think there's uh, half a dozen parking spots in there now. And that's a real central location. And you might even, maybe you could provide some sort of overhead uh, as, as a semi-sheltering. Uh, um, and I assume all, all racks are equally secure whether they're the round or, or square, rectangular. Uh, and to that point, I think the, the circular ones might be a little better in that they would be less likely to be used for anything else, uh, hanging things on or climbing on or, or what have you. I think it, it might add just some level of uh, deterrent. Um, the alleyways were mentioned. I, I believe those alleyways are used by businesses for loading and unloading. Um, and, and as you had mentioned too, the, the uh, red zones at intersections, I think using those would also add uh, a, a level of uh, visibility. If you have bikes there, no one's going to uh, illegally park there. If, you know, so that that uh, could open up the the intersections as well. So uh, yeah, I think as you say, be, beginning downtown, uh, focus downtown with uh, hopefully a hundred bike racks, and uh, I, but I think the corrals are definitely the, the way to go. Strategically placed, if you have you know ten or fifteen, I think that's a lot of bikes. You know, but if they're around, if I want to go to Kentucky Street, I can park up there. If I want to go to Washington, down, you know, on one end or the other. So, I don't know, three or four spots might be ideal. But that's it. Those are my comments. Thank you. So, I'm going to be silly and say I'll be generous from you can have all of the sites that we figured out for the electric bikes since that's still a program that's a year or two away. So we spent a lot of time in the downtown area figuring out the seven or eight spots besides the one across from uh, Safeway. So you can have all of those corral spaces, which includes one at City Hall and one at the, I don't know, the Round Street that's down there at, across from. Anyway, you know, so you can have all those. That's eight or nine spots already of corrals. Um, and, you know, sometimes at the end of the street where the red zones are now painted, um, I worry about, I would imagine it would be worked out that no bike would be hit by a stupid car. Um, uh, so that would be my only, you know, scary part is that it's not protected enough. Um, because when the electric bikes were going to be in, there was going to be something to protect them out there, right? So are we building that in with the bike parking also? Um, so, yeah, that's, you know, it's we spent a lot of time figuring out where those spots are, and, and you can have them all, right? Because we're still one or two years away from, then we'll find new spaces for that, you know, including across from the library that was going to be, you know, every time I go to the library now and I drive and I, and I park in that first slot, I used to say, oh, electric bikes are going to be here now, and I won't be able to park in that slot anymore. So, because, um, you know, yes, I go to the library all the time, and the five or six that are under the overhang of the library, besides the, the bike fix-it repair thing, um, you know, I, I love the library for doing what it does, but it needs more, right, so we can get more... Um, grown-ups and kids and stuff. So anyway, okay, that's, um, oh, and I'm really into the round one. 
when I see it down in San Francisco, I'm like, oh, that's pretty. Because the other ones are just kind of lumpy. I don't know. So, um, But my question is that, you know, it's big at 36 inches. So does a child's bike fit in it? You know, if there's a parent and a child, does the child bike fit in a bigger, roundier one? I mean, they probably will lock it to the parents, but anyway, that would be my... And then if, I know we can't park them on the sidewalk, I know that, but if we do put them someplace for the first couple of years, can we put paint that says, park your bike this way? Right? Because so, they, hello, it doesn't go this way. It goes with the, you know, just that simple education with the bike little logo or something to say, this is how you park your bike with the bike rack. Okay, thank you. And, I'll, sorry, you know, I laugh every time I go into Copperfields and there's still that bike rack that's out in front. I just think it's so cute, but okay. Yeah, um, in terms of bike rack style, they're all very utilitarian, and I and I know they're performing a function. Um, I kind of prefer the round ones, the circular ones, in a way. But I did want to ask. I mean, could they be decorated? Maybe not by the manufacturer, but I mean, could we do something that would be acceptable to the downtown historic folks to make them kind of arty? I got to say, you know, those utility boxes that got painted by all those artists throughout downtown, that's just glorious. I just love that. I know there's not a lot of surface area, but other than just that steel look, I wonder if there's something that could be done to make them a little more aesthetically pleasing. Yeah, there's actually, um, so the, the vendor offers several color options for powder coating <laughs> and um, I'm, HCPC will weigh in on the color. Yeah, uh, I did. I didn't. Uh, I didn't bring that to you all okay. because yeah. yeah, it's more in their purview. But um, uh, yes, and then it, there is uh, we. There are also custom racks, of course, that are more artistic, right? And include um, there's you know some some cities do a custom shape, you know that kind of symbolizes something significant about their city. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, or sometimes they add a bar that has some sort of text or other design engraved into it. Yeah. Um, of course, doing that just is going to drive, would drive the cost up and, and limit the number of racks we could purchase. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll definitely be giving HCPC the option to weigh in on colors. <laughs> okay. I mean, yeah. yeah. Any, something other than just the, the steel look, um, yeah. But I get it. We're, we're trying to maximize the value of this. Um, uh, I like the, the circular ones because they appear to me to be the kind where, you know, two bikes or even a third bike, if the wheels are positioned correctly, you can park them on either side and then maybe have a second one on one side, depending on how people arrange their, you know, their pedals. But so I think that that gives more uh, parking overall. Um, so I kind of like that. Um, and uh, I share the sentiments that were already uh, voiced about not putting more parking bike racks, I should say, on the sidewalks in downtown. There's just too much going on. Um, I wonder if there's a need for more than one corral on a street like Kentucky, or if we're thinking, uh, when I think about riding my bike down to get my hair cut or down to Copperfields, it would be kind of nice to know that as soon as you turn uh, from Western onto Kentucky, you'd see the thing. You'd see the corral. Mm -hmm. And, of course, not to be out of the way of, you know, car movement, of course. Um, and and uh, so that, that, to me, might be a consideration. If we were going to do a couple of smaller sets, maybe uh, one closer to, to Western and Kentucky, and then maybe one a little further down towards Copperfields, wondering whether... Uh, you know, you've got a crosswalk there, a lot of paint. It almost seems like it's there's a space that's protected, and maybe folks would feel comfortable 
riding and jumping off and then parking in that same area since there's some more activity. Just a thought. Um, those couple of uh, walkways between the alleys and the parking garage, et cetera. Um, I wonder if those could be used uh, for some more racks. Um, can we install into the cobblestones with this kind of thing? Like, uh, you know, where Western would, would continue to the Belshaw Bridge. Um, there are some spaces, areas in there that might be used. I don't know if there's an installation issue, but I kind of think that that would be uh, a well-used area. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I guess I would like to just say that, you know, that whole section of Water Street where all the larger uh, rest, restaurant parklets went, there's so many. I think that needs to be well thought through because there's... I think ultimately we'll have other uses in all of Water Street, you know, beginning at the Belshaw Bridge and going north. Um, I would want us to think about, I, mean, I think there was a time when there were festivals that were held in that very area. So it, it would appear that it's open now where there's benches, et cetera. But if it's the kind of area where you might actually have some downtown or, you know, that area event, maybe maybe think about where the parking where the bike racks might be to not be in the center of an area where people might be gathering, I guess is uh, a comment. Um, yeah. So otherwise I think it's, I, I love it and I hope we can um, choose something that gets us good value and, uh, and is easy to see. Thanks. Great. Um, just a couple comments. I do aesthetically like the circular one the most, but I just want bike parking, so any of them would be acceptable. Um, just fitting as many as you can is great. Um, I, I like bike corrals. I like the uh, on sidewalk when it you know space allows. So I I agree with the comments on not overcrowding sidewalks that are already narrow and overcrowded. Um, so downtown, I think corrals make a lot of sense. Um, and was also thinking about if we've daylighted curbs to um help with turn you know people turning when as they're driving i wouldn't want a bike getting hit either so yeah i don't know if there's similar to a bike share system if there is kind of an end cap or something you can put um so that people aren't getting hit and then i just had one question i believe the climate action commission's active transportation ad hoc had potentially recommended or put forth a couple, um, yeah, recommendations around locations for bike parking. And I'm just wondering if you remember what those are and if they're aligned with what we're talking about and that's all. Off the top of my head, I do not, but I do have that. And so, yeah, well, we'll we will add that to the, it'll be considered along with all the requests we've gotten and other, um, other requests we've received over the years. Yeah. Um, well, I think good bike parking is visible bike, bike parking, which is why I prefer the circular design. Uh, I also was going to note if you could add maybe some reflective tape or lighting in those areas, just trying to think of folks who might be parking at night. I also prefer bike corrals. Uh, if, if the historical folks have some concerns, I, I think bright pink would be an excellent choice for the color. A Again, making it highly visible. Uh, but the other thing I was going to say is if they need, we can dress it up like a wagon wheel. Um, I, I would like to point out that before the Sheffield design, it used to be like logs and concrete pillars that they would just mill into. So it does look closest to a historical bike rack example. I'm sure they will not appreciate any of those comments, but I'll say them to you. Um, the... <laughs> With more more practical comments, uh, I, I also prefer corrals for the downtown. I would also be terrified to see more things taking up our sidewalks because we all know our downtown sidewalks are peppered with signs, people, and just cracks already. Um, I also prefer intersections. I think that's a great spot for a lot of them. One area, though, that I'd like to highlight because recognizing that alleyways are used for loading and offloading. So, yeah, they're not just these places where people walk around. Uh, Right. There's that kind of, it's it, not an actual street, but that corridor from Petaluma Market to the Keller Street parking lot to uh, the game store to Copperfields, 
to the park, to the alleyway, those are all high pedestrian traffic areas. It's also where you see a lot of kids and their, their parents as well. I think those, anything we can do to put corrals closer to those areas is also a good idea. And I, I will just highlight again, there is that mostly empty park that would be great for some just on-site parking. Um, and then outside of that, um, I, I think that's it. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, let's see. We are not taking any, we're not voting on this. So this is just feedback. So we can uh, close out this item. And I was actually, I have on my little note here, I was going to recommend we all just very briefly do as, just stretch, just get up and stand for a second as Pamela is illustrating. We've been sitting for a while. It's good practice. So if you'd like to, I'd invite everyone, including people watching, just get up and stretch for a second. And for anyone keeping score at home, council adjourned at 920, I believe, on Monday. So that's our that's our goal tonight. <laughs> Get out of here before 920. <laughs>
I have nothing regarding discussion. Um, I would like PBAC to authorize the chair to provide a letter of support for the City Council Transportation Development Act, Article 3, Funds for Active Transportation Plan. Great. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, great. Did you see that, Shelley? That was Blake. Okay. Would you uh, call roll? Awesomeyer? I agree. Bond? Yes. Tar? Yes. Webb? Yes. Hooper? Yes. Wilkinson? Yes. Great. Thank you, Ken. I think you're all set on this one. We, we can close this item. Thank you. Glad we could be brief on that one. Okay, uh, moving on to uh, item five, recommendation to appoint a citizen representative to Sonoma County Transportation Authority Countywide Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee. Uh, not a CEQA project, and I will hand this over to, is this also Ken? Okay, Ken, I'll hand it back to you. Okay, thank you very much. So um, uh, the S -S -S SCTA, um, you know, countywide bicycle pedestrian advisory committee is, you know, meets monthly, and as part of the uh, protocol of uh, and the and the focus of this group is that each of the ten municipalities could have you can have a total of twenty members, and then. Besides the city staff, which are voting members, we can also have a citizen member. And uh, personally, I just I think it would be a good idea just to, to make sure that we're you know seeing all the different opportunities that are out there to provide for active transportation. So the request is uh, Chair Bond for the uh, PBAC here to appoint a citizen representative to the SCTA. Uh, countywide bicycle pedestrian advisory committee. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, I will open it up if anyone on the committee has questions for Ken. Uh, I have one question, Ken. Uh, on the handout we have, um, it says meets every other month, and you said it meets every month. I'm, yeah, I was mistaken. I am sorry. I, okay. It is it, it is every month, every other month. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Your folks are awake. That's excellent at this late hour. Thank you, Jerry. Can can, can what, could you go over a little more exactly what what is the purpose and what would be the goal? What would we achieve by doing this? Or well, it, it's. SCTA is a is a key or you know is a key entity in in how we do transportation improvements in the county, and um, I think there's a lot of different um, things that go on with it. They they basically hold the purse strings, you know. That's and and we want to make sure that. Um, with the, the 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 monies that come in through, you know, this is primarily state um, come come from the state to MTC to SCTA. That you know the um, the way those monies are spent and the work that SCTA does, you know, is 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 benefiting each of the each of the communities individually, but also the county, you know, regional, and. Um, you know, it, it's um, they do a really good job. They've got really good folks there, um, and and um, I I think it's it's a you know an opportunity to be able to provide for input in you know how public monies are spent in in the the most you know judicious and equitable and fair way, and and um, you know in our our transportation. And obviously, we would hope it's more focused on active transportation. Right. Um, so, you know, and, and Bjorn may want to chime in on this, but um, that's how, that's how, how many, I look at it. How so. many people are on this on the, that committee now? I should know this, I suppose, but I don't. Well, it's 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 the the ten each of the municipalities. 
okay. is there. And, and um, you know, Eris Weaver is really good. She shows up and occasionally there's, there's other community members, um, but it's, it's primarily each of the municipalities um, that, that, that are there. And we're meeting in person now. Okay, and again, I pardon me for not knowing this, but who is our current representative? I'm actually the chair, oh. so I I didn't raise my hand, and they said <laughs> I'm not sure how that happened, but um, but isn't the, yeah. this the Everybody first time? Step back, <laughs> Ken. Isn't this the first time that um, we've been offered the opportunity to take a seat on this board? It is, and it was, it, it actually, you know, this came about through um, kind of, you know, Dana Turry looking into the, the bylaws um, and and the, the formation of it, and it, it allows for 20 members, and it's like, well, you know, here's, the, 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 the citizen members cannot vote, but they can participate in it, so, um, yeah, um, it is the first time, correct. Okay, um, we can move to public comment on this item. I just want to mention two things before we do in case the public wanted to comment on it. Um, we might want to consider having a one-year term for this liaison person. Um, could be something else, but that's something to consider. And then I would also, you know, just think about whose term is expiring in June and perhaps you know, wanting someone on this committee who is going to still be on PBAC after that point. So we're not going through this again in a couple months. Um, so with that, I'll open it up to public comment and then we can come back to the committee. The public's invited to make comments on this item. Public comments are limited to three minutes per person. If you have not done so already, please fill out a speaker card and bring it to the clerk. Clerk, were there any comments received prior to the meeting? There were no public comments received. Okay. Thank you. And do we have any? Okay. No, no in-person public comments. Thank you. All right. We can now uh, close public comment and I'll bring it back to the committee for discussion. Um, so if there's any discussion, if not, um, if someone wants to nominate themselves or someone else, you're welcome to speak up and do so. Go ahead, Patricia. So um, question, Ken, how many other cities have a citizen representative? Um, Will we be the first? We may probably be the first. I mean, we were kind of the first on Vision Zero. and We kind of lead the charge on things. So I, I have not been in direct contact with other um you know, municipalities on the specifics of how they're moving this forward. But I, you know, I feel like it's something that's important. So, um, yeah, there's no, no sort of go by on this, uh, what other, other towns are doing. I will, I will say, I think Petaluma is, is probably one of the more proactive on these types of things, um, you know, getting involved in uh, such. Then my other sort of comment or question, um, can we think about it and, and make a vote next week, next meeting, right? Instead of sort of now everybody, you know, we may want to think about it. I mean, it was in our agenda. We sort of read it. But now that we have a little more clarification, maybe we need to sort of think about it. And can we vote next week? Next month. Next month, sorry. Ken, is there a, a timeline? Were you hoping to have this done by when you're meeting next? No, no, not at all. Not at all. And there might also be, you know, we're missing several members today. So there might also be someone that is interested that is not here. Um, so I guess we can, if so, would you like to make a motion, Patricia? Or sorry, you have a question, Marja. Go ahead. I just had a question. When would the next meeting be, Ken? Uh, it's going to be May. Um... May May twenty third, and they typically they started they 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 start at one thirty, and um, because I'm running it, it ends fairly quickly. I can usually keep it to you know under an hour and a half, sometimes just an hour. Last one was Challenge. an hour. So that's that's good information. If we're going to follow what Patricia had just mentioned, perhaps 
keep not do this now, but do it in May. I just wanted to make sure that we had ample time to actually, once we get our representative, that they have time to plan and yeah. be able to attend. So a, a, a suggestion might be to to have you know Shelley you know send out a, a a request to the PBAC members of who they would like to nominate themselves or somebody else, and maybe you can you know kind of get a get a leg up when when you do meet um, you know in in uh, May there, and then the person could you know hopefully you'd have that settled on um, you know May fifth, and then I'm sorry. Um, May uh, 3rd and then you could um, the person could attend on May 23rd so chair if I may um, we also have by my count five committee members whose terms expire uh, June 30th so um, that's something else to be mind well I know you mentioned that but um, just for the do you say who they are Bjorn uh, yes so uh, Camarda Bjorke Webb Wilkinson and um, and then both of our uh, our planning commission and recreation music and parks commission representative uh, representatives are showing as being up in June but that doesn't sound right you were just reappointed right so that might that needs to be updated so then it would be uh, so it would be Wilkinson Bjorke Camarda and Webb are the uh, the four then who and I'm probably around. completely done because I'm turned out turned, right right so so that that okay. also influences uh, be that is one of the SCTA requirements is that you do have to be on a the bicycle advisory committee for the jurisdiction you're representing so yeah so um, moving moving forward here would mm -hmm. Patricia or someone else like to make a motion that we move this to our May meeting and Shelly can um, email folks and maybe send those expert term dates, those expiration dates so that folks know when their term is up. Um, or does anyone have any more comments or questions? And if not, does someone want to make a motion? I'll make that motion that we move it uh, to the next meeting, our next meeting to decide on this. I'll second that. Uh, clerk, would you, uh, is that uh, acceptable the way we've just phrased all of that before you take roll? If you could just repeat that one more time. Jerry, would you, go ahead. I make a motion that we move this. I make a motion that we move this item to our next uh, meeting uh, to vote on it at that time. And Shelley, I seconded. So if you once you have that, if you could call roll. Osselmeyer? Yes. Bond? Yes. Tar? Yes. Webb? Yes. Hooper? Yes. Wilkinson? Yes. Okay, great. We can close that item. Thank you, everyone. And move on. We have two things left, committee comment and then staff comment. For committee comment, I don't have everyone's titles broken down on my agenda anymore. Um, so we can just go down the line. Blake, do you want to start with anything you have? Uh, sure. Our next planning commission meeting, I just found out maybe two hours before this has been canceled. So I, I won't have anything for you there. Uh, I will say, though, that uh, we're looking at updates coming from both the development of Washington with MidPen, and then uh, there's more rumbling again from the development near Caulfield. So we might see that again. Uh, but right now, it's kind of all quiet till later in the month. Um, I, I just wanted to briefly share, I was able to help uh, set up and, and uh, lead a protect, demonstration protected bike lane in Calistoga for work over the weekend. But it, it was a really interesting process to see. It was in partnership with their public works department. They pulled an encroachment 
uh, permit for us. It was just for the length of a, a safety day event that the Parks and Recreation uh, department was putting on. Um, but Public Works they laid out 100 or so delineators um, that three <laughs> volunteers and I moved, which was quite a workout. Um, but we set, we set up the, uh, the bike lane. It was already a class two. And so we just put the delineators just outside of that line a little bit into the vehicular lane because there was enough space and created a class four. Um, and the bike coalition was at the safety day event, uh, the Napa County bicycle coalition, and they led a community safety ride, um, that took the community throughout the city led by police escorts to make it extra safe because there were kids. Um, but they ended on the protected bike lane. There are no protected bike lanes, uh, right now in Calistoga. Um, so they ended on that to give people a feel and we were tabling my organization and had a map of the city and these fun like dot stickers. So people could put on the map of the city where they might want to see a protected bike lane. So we can try another one and see, is this feasible to, to do this permanently in a particular location and collected just a bunch of other good feedback, but people were really, really excited. I heard nothing but positive, uh, comments from folks even the pedestrians that were walking in it because there's no sidewalk on that street. And so they were super excited to have some kind of protection just walking with their kid in a stroller. Um, so I just wanted to share that. It was an interesting partnership between several departments within a city and nonprofits and other organizations, and it went really well. So I would love to see you know, pop-ups, and I know there's so much appetite for that in the community. So I think it's just nice to share a successful um, version. And that's all I have. I'll pass it along to Pamela. Um, hearing that there are four committee members who either may reapply or may be termed out, just wondering if we are going to put out some feelers to try to get some more representation, maybe by May, right? If we need folks ready to go in June and July. I'm just hoping yeah, someone's thinking about that. That's a, a lot of recruitment. Yeah, I think generally that's handled by uh, the clerk's office in partnership with um, our communications team. They usually do a pretty good job getting the word out about vacanc upcoming vacancies for applications. Great. Yeah. Great. And um, thinking that uh, butter and egg days is coming up before long, wondering if there's uh, anything the, that um, has been discussed that this committee or the city is doing regarding, you know, in terms of pop-ups and uh, sharing information. Um, I'm wondering, is there anything that the city's planning on doing to use that opportunity to solicit input on any of the topics we've been talking about, whether it's bike racks, bike rack parking um, locations, or any other educational you know, knowing that we had a presentation today, uh, thinking about times when lots of people gather and we might be able to so, uh, solicit input or have people give us comments on things. wondered if you knew anything in that regard. Yeah, there are um, some good, really good upcoming opportunities for engagement. Um, I think we're, we'll be focusing our efforts at those on the active transportation plan. Um, and I'll have an update on that in my staff comment. Oh, okay. So, yeah. All right, that's all I got. Okay, Marsha, you're up. I'm good. You're good, okay. Jerry, do you have anything? I got here faster than I expected. Um, uh, one comment is uh, first Friday at five is this uh, Friday at uh, Walnut Park, five o'clock. It's a community ride around the community. It's kind of a uh, spur of the moment where we go. So uh, it's fun, it's family orientated. Anyone can come, kids are, are always welcome. And uh, it usually lasts about an hour, maybe an hour and a half, something like that. And uh, it's enjoyable, come and meet some new people. Okay. Also, I, I wanna give a shout out to the uh, Petaluma Wheelmen, they had their, uh, I think it's quarterly uh, roadside cleanup. They adopted a section of uh, Stony Point from Meacham to, and that's what I was trying to look up, the next road over. I can't think the name of it though. Uh, no, but anyway, they did that uh, last Sunday and it was, uh, they've been doing it now for about two years. So that's our Petaluma Wheelman, our uh, road cycling group. And uh, thank you for doing that. And that's it, thank you. 
Okay, great. We will move on to staff comment. I'll pass it to Bjorn. All right, thank you. Let me get my screen share up again. All right. So um, coming to you in a new format this month with the staff comments, um, trying out a, a PowerPoint um, to kind of aid with or have some visual aids while I walk through some updates. Um, and this is broken up into a few categories. Um, first up, just updates on some of the bigger um, projects out of our, our capital improvement program. Uh, so leading off with the active transportation plan, um, we are still working closely with Fair and Peers to develop the draft project map, which uh, incorporates uh, many of your comments um, that were made to, uh, to Jeff in, in your one-on-ones with him and, and other meetings with Jeff uh, over the last year. Um, that will all be feeding into an interactive online map that will be available in English and Spanish and um, allow people to place um, basically to upvote, downvote, or suggest new um, projects that are not included in the draft uh, project map. Um, and so we have, uh, this was actually added, we added this to the scope uh, a few months ago. This wasn't originally in their scope um, to do an interactive um, online engagement tool, but we thought it was important um, to uh, to not just do outreach for this in person and have that um, that online interactive option. We are also um, we've got all of PCAC's recommendations as far as you know specific uh, physical infrastructure improvements and also their more um, programmatic uh, recommendations. And so we are um, looking at each of those and, and incorporating those. Um, and then to the point about uh, so there are yeah there are a few upcoming opportunities to do. Uh, tabling, where at the very least we'll be um, sharing QR codes for um, to access the active transportation plan webpage and all of those interactive um, and educational materials. So um, we'll be doing uh, definitely be sharing more on that as soon as things are available. Uh, Caulfield Bridge, really exciting news. We issued the request for proposals for basically all of the work needed to um, bring that project up to shovel ready status. Um, and there is a lot of it. There will be a lot of environmental uh, permitting and design work needed. But we issued that in February and um, are targeting um, uh, an award of that contract in, uh, in the, the coming months. And uh, so that's, that's exciting to see movement on that project. The D Street traffic calming and Fifth Street neighborhood greenway projects are both um, in design and um, tracking on a very similar timeline actually and uh, so we are targeting may for releasing those designs for um, basically for a final round of community engagement before we then put them out to bid and uh, award the construction contracts for those to be installed um, this summer garfield drive paving uh, the construction contract for that was awarded at council a couple of weeks ago uh, we are holding a community workshop next Wednesday, um, the April 12th at 6 p.m. to introduce the project to the to the neighborhood and um, uh, give an opportunity for people in the public to ask questions and share feedback. There was some feedback. We received feedback from council um, and from some members of the public that they would like us to um, consider uh, what type of bike facilities are appropriate for Garfield. Um, it's actually not, it, it was not in our, uh, bicycle and pedestrian master plan, um, which was adopted in 2008. So we were not originally looking at this as a, as a bike facility. Um, that being said, we're going to open up that to the, um, to the community, um, get some feedback on, you know, what type of bike facilities are wanted and appropriate there, given the, the nature of the street, the vo traffic volume, uh, with, et cetera. Um, and we'll also be coming to you um, to PBAC for your feedback on that. But we're going to go to the neighborhood first, and then we'll come to PBAC. And you'll have the benefit of knowing what the uh, what information feedback we got from the neighborhood. North McDowell Complete Streets is under construction. I'm sure you've seen that. Uh, they're starting, they're focusing on 
utilities, sidewalks, curb ramp, and curb ramps for now. Um, and it pay, Ken is actually managing this project. Ken, I don't know if you have anything you want to add on the status of um, North McDowell. Uh, well, it's it's super exciting. Um, a little bit boring right now. It's mainly utility installation, curb ramp, and sidewalk work. Um, we're going to head south of Corona. You know, I've met with Relief. We've walked the site with Relief. Going to look at opportunities for improving the, the vegetation and, and getting trees in there. Um, and, um, you know, the Hawk system, we are, we are going to put in all the, the key backbone appurtenances for, a, you know, a stop condition crossing. So this is a level up from the, the rectangular rapid flashing beacons, the RRFBs you hear about. So that's going in and um, yeah, it's, uh, it's exciting to see. And, and I will say it, people aren't complaining about the traffic. Um, so I think people are, have probably been so numbed with poor pavement, they're just glad to see any work going on, but uh, it's going well. Thanks for asking. Thank you, Ken. Um, on uh, the Rainier parking protected bike lane demonstration or, or pilot, um, we're continuing to collect feedback uh, and, uh, and, and data on speeds and um, other traffic related data. There is a new survey that was posted, I believe last month, and that's linked here. Um, the majority of the responses we received to the first survey that we posted for Rainier were received in the first week or two before the demonstration project was even finished <laughs> with its installation. So that was our reasoning for coming back. You know, now it's the, the, in, the demonstration project has been in place for quite some time. People have had time to adjust to it, um, you know, get a, a feel for the, the roadway operations. And so that's uh, our reasoning for going back with another survey. And then uh, disappointing news on the, the wayfinding pilot. Um, we did put that out to bid um, and didn't actually get any bids from local contractors. Apparently, the, there was a contractor out there that did wayfinding, uh, a lot of local wayfinding projects, um, and, and they have since, since retired. And so um, we're hoping to find a, a local contractor who's able to um, deliver that project for us, um, understanding that we'll likely be doing a lot more of this work in the, in the near future. Uh, some so moving quickly through some uh, uh, we'll call this quick builds and work orders because not all of these are actually quick build projects. Some of them were just uh, simple work orders delivered by our um, our street crews. Uh, we've got uh, I'm sure many of you have seen the um, the quick build uh, painted bulb outs at um, 10th and B Street. They also um, moved the the stop signs out into the street into a more visible location and um, got some parking stop parking blocks out there um, to help provide some um, additional protection for uh, for people crossing the street by foot. And um, this was delivered in response to a, a neighborhood petition we received from residents on 10th Street um, and, and also um, uh, one of their neighbor, someone who lives on, I believe, either 10th or C Street right there was um, hit while crossing um, by a driver who, who ran a stop sign. Uh, this is uh, Ken's project, the I Street um, Gateway Traffic Calming. Um, this was just installed last week and uh, basically involved um, adding buffered, uh, buffers to the existing bike lanes out there, adding green paint to the conflict zones. And then also um, on the right side there, you can see these are uh, speed reduction markings. Um, they basically, um, it's sort of a visual cue to drivers, um, make them more aware of their speed as they're entering town. Um, Ken, anything you want to add about the I Street um, Gateway project? Um, no, I'm I'm excited about it. It's you know it, it's it, it kind of embodies what we want to do on many of the roads in in Petaluma, and you've heard me say this: it, uh, we have too much pavement. You know, we've got big, wide streets, and there's no context and I Street in particular um, is is you know going from a rural highway into basically a neighborhood. There's there's no context to that. So, you know this this is an MUTCD approved. Um, they call them optical speed bars. Um, they have you know proven effectiveness, um, speed reduction markings. Some people say, 
And then we've narrowed the lanes. We've got buffered bike lanes. We've daylighted curbs. We put in green, you know, paint on the conflict zone. So this this project here is kind of embodies what I, I think we need to, you know, look at doing on many of of the uh, the city's streets. Where you know we're we're you know doing visual clues to give context to drivers what's going on and, and make it safer for everybody but particularly you know pedestrians and bicyclists to comfortably move around in their neighbor so thank you thanks ken um and then we've got oh no photo for this one but the next Sorry, update Bjorn, yeah. we're, we're gonna i'm just gonna let him run through it so just take notes and then we'll yep. get to questions thanks thanks um no, no photo for the next one, but um, the uh, we did get the lights underneath 101 on Lynch Creek Trail are now on 24-7. So that was some feedback we got, including from the chair and, and maybe from um, other committee members. Uh, and uh, so those are now on 24-7, and hopefully that's helping with visibility under the, the dark undercrossing. Um, we also really excited to share, we um, just this week uh, issued a work order to remove all bollards in the path of travel on Lynch Creek Trail um, between Water Street and Prince Park. So that'll include these two uh, on the, uh, uh, the the bridge over uh, between Water Street. Uh, so uh, exciting. Not sure on the exact timing on those, but now they're at least in the queue um, for removal. We installed a new crosswalk at Magnolia Avenue and Pepperwood Lane. So this is on the stretch between, um, basically between Keokuk and Petaluma Boulevard, a uh, long stretch without um, very good pedestrian uh, accommodations. And this was in response to a, a, a resident request. The Upham Bassett traffic circle, hopefully you've all uh, seen it, if not, go uh, take a spin around it after we're out here. Um, it's just right over there. Um, but that's been upgraded into its semi-permanent uh, installation with the um, uh, sort of the rubber curbs uh, surrounding the perimeter. Um, it does have a bigger perimeter now. So I th it, it does seem to be slowing uh, drivers down even more than the, than the previous quick build version. Um, Ken, what's, what's still needed there to finalize it? Just some signage? Yeah, the the uh, the large barricades were there just to give a little bit more visual presence to it. So we're going to leave that there for a while, and then actually just put in you know signs. Um, so it, it'll it'll be cleaned up, but you know it's it's a it's a it's a change in the infrastructure, and you know in this business, no good deed goes unpunished. So we want to make sure people have an awareness of what's you know what's going on and get used to it. And, you know, we had, we had a 20, 20 foot diameter circle there, but it was in paint. And so now we've put a, there's a raised curve and we're going to put some reflective, uh, um, you know, elements on that to make sure it's fully visible at night. Um, but, um, that's kind of the, the, you know, the, the direct traffic engineering type changes that, that you'll see on that. All right. Thank you. And then we have, um, sorry, advancing the slide here, uh, the Windsor Drive improvements also requested uh, by a neighborhood group out near the, the west end of Victoria, Edinburgh and Cambridge Lane um, have been asking for traffic calming and uh, pedestrian improvements near that intersection. Um, and so we've, uh, we've got a uh, what we think is a, a really good design that will address their concerns there. And um, we'll be introducing those to the neighborhood at a neighborhood meeting uh, via Zoom next Monday, the 10th at 6 p.m. And there's more information about the project um, on that web page link there, as well as um, the meeting details. Uh, but it will include, the current proposal includes um, a crosswalk uh, extensions to the the concrete medians, um, a, a pedestrian refuge island as part of that extended median. And um, we're also adding uh, bike lanes between uh, where they currently terminate west of Victoria. We're going to basically bring them into Victoria along the length of that concrete median. Um, 
and that will narrow the travel lanes down to about 10 feet. So win-win um, there. And Ken, I'll pause there. I know you wanted to give an update on, there was the, the public comment letter we received about uh, Upham for the uh, a crosswalk request at Upham and Bodega. Ken, if you wanna just give a quick update. Yeah, I just, I, I wanted to let, uh, you know, committee members, uh, Chair Bond, committee members know about, you know, this, the uh, public comment there uh, from Todd Grasick is, um, you know, this happened a while ago. And, and I said, yeah, we, you know, we do need to do something there. And I actually have a design for improving the, the it, it's kind of a little bit in the same way what I'm doing on I Street for traffic calling I want to do on Bodega. Bodega is kind of a, a bit of a beast of a, a road coming into town and there really isn't a safe crossing, so I get it. Um, and and you know, I have heard Todd Grasick's concern there loud and clear. Uh, there's also a couple other uh, neighbors, residents in the area that have other concerns on the speeding and such. And so I actually have a draft design done, but um, getting into it, talking with the, the city's communications team, talking with uh, Bjorn, we felt like it, it really needs to go in front of the public um, before we do it. And that's something that, you know, things take a little bit longer. We, we you know, I feel like the city has a, has a very good ear to the public's concerns and we can't just take, you know, one or two of the concerns if it's, you know, it, it needs to be opened up. And so, you know, I, I'm appreciative of Bjorn's work, you know, working with Jess, Jessica Medina to move this forward, but it's, we've got a few other things. One project that, that, um, you should know about um, is Maria, and and that's I'm I'm driven to get that into construction this year. And we've had one public meeting on that. So between all the different projects that you've heard about and the public input, you know, the the work on Bodega will happen. It's just it's got to be done in 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 a careful you know stepwise fashion. So um, don't take his email, you know too much to heart. We are working on it. We will, you know, we will be responding on it. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Ken. Um, should we share my screen here? Uh, some grant updates. Um, so we learned, I believe in February, Ken, um, that uh, the city was, um, the, the SCTA board approved uh, what they called the, the cycle one of the SCTA funding program. Basically, uh, a few years ago, they recognized that there were a lot of upcoming um, local, regional, and statewide uh, funding opportunities. And they asked each city in Sonoma County to submit a list of five priority projects for consideration. And then they kind of looked at the projects considered how well they met SCTA's criteria and then and then um, matched them up with what they thought were the best funding sources for the projects. And the two projects that they selected from Petaluma were Lynch Creek Trail and um, uh, Caulfield Lane uh, paving and uh, active transportation improvements. So those were both funded through the, um, the first cycle of the funding program. Uh, we don't have exact timing uh, for either of those projects yet um, but we'll be definitely sharing more information as they um, as those as those projects develop and then um, recently we submitted an application to the Metropolitan Transportation Commission for a, um, a, a downtown area parking management plan and that would include not only a uh, an inventory of all of our on and off street parking spaces uh, in the downtown area but also um, some counts so that we get a sense of utilization um, throughout our downtown in, in public and private facilities. And, um, and then it will also yield, um, if again, if, if this is funded, it would yield uh, recommendations for how to better manage our, um, our parking supply. And then we also submitted an application to uh, SCTA in their, trans they have a, it's called the Transportation Fund for clean air, 
they issue a call for projects uh, each year for that. And um, it's, it's kind of a tricky one because um, transit gets first bite at the apple. Um, and so we transit puts in for their funds and then they have a sort of a leftover um, uh, bucket, which is their competitive portion, which um, cities are then free to apply to. Um, and the the best, the easiest projects to um, uh, to meet their their grant criteria are are bike lane projects of any kind. They could be um, protected standard bike lanes, class three bike lanes. Um, and so we quickly uh, learned, we learned of the competitive portion availability. We were the only city in the county to submit for it. And the two projects that rose to the top of the list that were in our existing bike plan, where we thought we could easily implement them with very little available funding, about $100,000 were um, uh, bike lanes and then traffic calming pedestrian improvements for Windsor Drive between um, basically for the length of Victoria. Uh, which has uh, long been proposed as a class two facility. And then also um, Sunny Slope Avenue between D Street and I Street, which has also long been proposed as a class two facility. So relatively straightforward um, striping projects with good opportunities to make some other improvements on both of those corridors. And then lastly, no, two more items, um, upcoming events. And I know you all know about um, the availability of Valley par Bike Parking at Butter and Egg Days Parade. I know that's something that uh, Bike Petaluma is providing. Um, I believe Safe Streets Petaluma is also doing a, a, bike, a bike float and are looking for um, people to join their float. So um, be sure to connect with Pete um, Gang or Bruce Hagen uh, on, to, to, to become part of their, um, their rolling float. Uh, bike to school day coming up on May 3rd and um, Sonoma County Safe Routes actually just put out an email with a lot of great info about bike to school day, including which schools are participating. Um, not all schools in Petaluma are, but there's a pretty good list of uh, somewhere between 10 and 15 schools that are participating. And then there's also a, um, a survey form uh, looking for people or an interest form looking for bike champions who are interested in uh, supporting efforts at um, you know, either their local school or their, you know, their children's school, grandchildren's school, um, finding ways to support um, more biking to school. Um, so be sure to check out, um, again, Sonoma County Safe Routes to Schools uh, website for more information. And then lastly, Bike to Wear Every Day is quickly approaching on May 18th. Um, we will be, I need to reach out to Eris about this actually, but we'll be, um, looking to sponsor an energizer station and um, we will send an email out to PBAC um, uh, looking for um, volunteers to help us with the energizer station. So stay tuned for that. And last slide, um, upcoming agenda items. Um, so uh, we've got the trail ad hoc committee, 2023 paving projects, uh, which will include Garfield, the active transportation plan, project prioritization criteria. That'll be a presentation from Fair and Peers, um, basically looking for guidance and feedback from PBAC on how we will prioritize, prioritize projects in the plan. Um, what kind of, you know, equity considerations, um, safety considerations, connectivity, et cetera. Uh, we'll have the presentation, I believe in June or July um, sometime this summer from City Thread with their uh, recommendations from their Excel Accelerated Mobility Playbook. Uh, we'll have an update on the Safe Streets nomination program, which is um, previously came to you as the Neighborhood Traffic Calming um, Request Program. And then uh, lastly, uh, an update hopefully soon on um, efforts to uh, create a task force system or program uh, in, in Petaluma for Safe Routes to Schools that creates an ongoing dialogue between um, schools, city, and, um, and the community around safety and active transportation at schools. Whew. All right. That's a long, lot of, lot of updates, but that's because we didn't meet in February. <laughs> so, or, uh, or sorry, in March. So that's all for me. Thanks. So okay. we didn't get that in our agenda. Are you sending it out to us? Yes, I will. Yep. Yep. Okay. And I'd really love to second that and have that every time. 
it's really, it gives us an opportunity or me an opportunity to take a look at a lot of things that we've talked about, making sure that we're, we're tracking things that I personally find important. And also it gives me an opportunity to go and visit many of these sites just to check out what is happening. So it's, if you could attach that next time and every time, that would be lovely. It will also be posted to the website. Great. Thank you. Marcia, did you have other questions for Bjorn? I did. I wanted to let you know that for safe routes to school, we have 11 schools in Petaluma that are participating. Reason I know that is I'm picking up their bags next week, and I have to take my big car because I need to make sure I have enough room to take all of the paraphernalia that mm -hmm. I then deliver to the schools the next day. So it's 11, which is more, I think, than we've had before. And then the question I had was... Um, Ken, you were talking about, if Ken's still on, yeah. the I Street gateway and traffic calming. Between what streets? But it, it's going between City Limit and, and uh, Gravelia. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, go ahead, Patricia. I just have a comment. So, um, so I just spent two weeks in Morocco, and I was just enjoying all of their different traffic things that they do when they have an island in the middle of the street for pedestrians it's there's little blue lights on the ground that light up so at nighttime the the whoever the the car the bus driving by knows there's an island in the middle and even they have green and red blinkies on the line so i was like ooh that's cool and you know trying to take pictures of it all it's like right and how many the the table humps right? Coming into town to slow everybody down. It was like, oh, oh, but then they also have police stops. So you have to show your license to show that you're licensed. And, you know, so that's a whole nother reality. But, you know, it was like, just, it's always, you know, they, they are a third world country. I couldn't drink their water, right? But they have great traffic <laughs> things, you know? And so it was just like, fascinating even their stop signs have lights around them so it lights up at night so you don't say oh i didn't see it right the the sign itself has little lights around it so i was just like going gaga over everything so anyway thanks patricia if you want to share those photos with shelly she can circulate them i'm very curious to see if you if you actually took photos okay Bring them next time. Um, Jerry, you had a question. Go ahead. I do. Uh, two, Ken, you mentioned, uh, or excuse me, Bjorn, uh, you did two surveys on um, Rainier. Was there a, a noticeable difference between the two, the responses? Um, I, we have not really dug into the second round uh, of data yet. Um, and, and then for Ken, I, I was curious, how do those uh, visual speed bumps on I Street, how, how does that work? There, there are speed gradation markings that are, you know, lateral lines on the edge. And it just it gives a perception of, of um, you know, your speed. Um, and, you know, the, the, the complete opposite of this is if you just got a, you know, a straight slab of asphalt with no markings, you don't have a sense of speed. But this this provides a visual clue as you're coming in and, and heightens your awareness, you know, of your speed. Um, and so it's a, it's kind of a, a visual effect. Um, Is there any indication of how fast you should or should not be seeing those? Lines well, I'm, I'm glad you asked that because I've got a, two contracts out, one for, you know, six signs and then the other for a contractor to install six speed radar signs. So Bjorn has all the details of that, but that um, those, those contracts are out and we're going to see, uh, you know, some more of these coming in on various streets, speed radar feedback signs. Okay. So that's the, you're going this fast? Yep. Okay. Yep. All right. Thank you. That's all. Will those be permanent or are they just 
for a while. Well, no, they're they're intended to be permanent. They're not. It's not a pilot. They'll be bolted onto the ground. They're they're solar, so it's the the installation effort is, you know, somewhat, um, you know, in within reason. We don't have to run power to them and such. So, um, you know, I'm we're we're considering them to be permanent, although they they could be unbolted and, you know, moved to another location. But uh, that's not the intent at this point. They're, they're not on a trailer, I should say. Okay, Blake, you have a question? Uh, well, first one's a comment. I My family lives right off of Grevillea, and I can attest that these changes have been noticed almost immediately, just because historically and ever since I was a kid, including my family, I'm not going to pretend they're not part of the problem, uh, people go about 80 miles an hour, I'm not exaggerating, down San Antonio through this, and they don't stop till you're well into the first intersection, which is about a mile away from where this image ends. Uh, the installation of this was almost night and day. I even got a comment from my dad who was who wanted to know when the city noticed that we had a speeding problem because people immediately started to slow down. There's also been a big issue because there have been several kids there who've almost gotten hit because of this. So. I just want to say folks there are very appreciative of this work. Um, and then I did have a question with regards to the um, MTC application for downtown parking management, which I'm very excited about because parking is my jam here. Um, will this potentially time out well with the city's other efforts to revisit its parking parking policy? Yes, that is, uh, that's the goal, to help inform all of those efforts. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, got it. Yep. Thank and, you. And um, sorry, I see um, that Gina just raised her hand. Um, she's, she's joining remotely. Thanks. Uh, Chair Vaughn and, uh, and committee members, I'd love to see the, um, <laughs> the, the interest and keen um, questions on staff comments. And I just want to remind everyone that staff comments aren't um, agendized subjects and items. So just to make sure that we don't have any Brown Act um, uh, issues, we, we really should not have discussion on staff comment items. If there's something from a staff comment that you want to follow up on, I recommend that we, you take the opportunity to contact the chair after the meeting, ask for it to be agendized for a later meeting so that we can have public comment and we're fully transparent, et cetera, just in, in the interest of the community on these. So I hate to I hate to squash good conversation, but I want to remind you that we need to be careful about that. So, um, and Bjorn, thank you for the excellent um, presentation on, and Ken on, on the updates. I got through almost all the meeting, Gina, without you having to chime in and remind me. So, <laughs> thank you for thank you for doing that. Maybe we can make it through the whole the whole one next time. Um, I will I will not ask any anything. Pamela, did in in light of what Gina said, is are you okay following up with Bjorn after the meeting if you had something? Yes. Okay. Um, the only thing, Bjorn, and I hope this is okay because we had previously talked about you mentioning it during your staff comment. Can you speak to the dollars that council had committed to pro active transportation projects? And I think you know what I'm, yeah, okay. Yeah, so that was a question that came in from council member Barnacle. Um, and I'm not sure if the, the rest of the committee saw that question. I know the chair did, um, but I'm a bit judging by the looks that the committee, okay, I don't, so um, I'll try to represent his question. Um, but uh, essentially, he was asking, there was a $1.2 million uh, during the budget cycle last year that were um, basically added to um, the, 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 sit, the budget that was approved by council for fiscal year 22-23 um, for active transportation improvements um, that are made as part of our um, uh, through our, our CIP roadway projects, basically. And um, so there was a request from 
the council member for us to give an update on um, how much has been spent to date. And while we do not have an exact dollar figure handy, um, we have done some sort of back of the envelope math on all of the CIP projects we've done this year, um, roadway related projects, total about 20 million. And we've estimated um, as a, a pretty safe assumption that that roughly um, 20, 20 to 25% of that has been um, spent on active transportation elements of those projects. And um, so the, the current figure we have is somewhere in the, in the four to $5 million range. Um, but that's something that we can provide a, a more precise update, I think, um, as we get closer to year end and have an opportunity to add up um, basically all of the different components of our, of our road, roadway projects. All right. Thank you, Bjorn. Thank you for the very thorough uh, updates. You guys are all doing so much work. Thank you to all of city staff for that. Um, and with that, I will adjourn the meeting at 9.11. Good job, everyone. We beat council <laughs> by nine minutes. All right. Good night.